I'm Donald Moffat. And I'm Heather Menzies. Logan's Run will not be on tonight. But stay tuned for the Charlie Brown special and the Fat Albert Halloween special. And we'll be back next Monday night. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Uh, this Superman portrait is really a send-up of the original Fleischer cartoon intro where you saw a quick explanation of the destruction of Krypton, the rocket ship coming to Earth, and the pose of Superman with fists on hips where he's kind of looking down a little bit. This is an exaggeration of that where I'm getting my traditional kind of Alex Ross low angle looking up the body kind of shot, which again, I'll credit to Neil Adams as an influence. Um, this is really just connecting with the most fundamental kind of influence in my life from uh, that cartoon shaping the way that I illustrate Superman. It also connects in ways I'd never even thought about when I was doing the piece with one of the most famous images that Steve Rude did in World's Finest of Superman where he kind of recreated that Fleischer moment with his painted figure of Superman and then I would spend the rest of my career pretty much doing what he did before me. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here with uh, the great Columbo fan himself. It's Tom King. There we go. Just one just one more thing. I don't mean to bother you. My <laughs> wife is such a fan. She <laughs> loves what you're doing with Danger Street. She thinks it's amazing. I could not say how jealous I am that you have a Columbo impression. I cannot do the voice at all. I, I feel utter t- There are voices I can do. I'm not without voices. But I can't. It's one of those. It just eludes me wherever wherever it is. I can't do it. Um, give me one of your. Give me one of your impressions. No, no, I'm not doing my impressions. Are you kidding? This is YouTube. Someone recorded for the rest of my life. It'll be out there. Uh, <laughs> Come how, on, other, man. no, no. Matt and I, Never. Fraction and I, he would do. He would do Orson Welles drunk, and I would do John Huston, and we talked. Because <laughs> he saw that Palma Sun, uh, out those outtakes of the Palma Sun wine commercials. Ah, the French. I was one of those kids who I would do impressions of impressionists. So when I was when I was in high school and would do I like I would do you know like Kevin Pollock's whole routine. You know I would do all those. I would do you know the the, the very exaggerated Kirk with the <laughs> and you know I, I I wouldn't do actual impressions of anyone. I would do impressions of impressionists doing impressions. That's what I did. So I, I was a bad photocopy really. Of oh, that's how I learned, man. How, well, anyways, it's nice to be here, John. Thank you for having me on. I've been listening to you now almost 20 years. My man, oh 18th, my 18th anniversary, May 10th. Oh, oh we're so old. 18 years of Word Balloon. We are, we are the oldest people on earth, I think. <laughs> we must, we're the last ones. It's just you, us, the last and of us. apes. Yes, <laughs> indeed. The, the now, can, I, can I confess? And, I, and listen, I'm so glad that everyone's loving it. Always good to have a good new genre fiction show. I'm just zombied out. Yeah, you know, honestly, I like Walking Dead was more than enough for me. I was never a big zombie person. I respected George Romero and and Night of the Living Dead and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm just like I'm not. And Max Brooks in World War Z. But yeah, I'm just like yeah, that's enough. I, I I people are saying wonderful things about it. I can't wait to go back to it. People say it's great. I paused it when there's a there's a big death about 45 minutes into the first one. And it's it's an emotional death, especially if you're a, a certain kind of well, if you're a parent. I think it's easy enough to say. And and I I just like uh, maybe not maybe not before dinner. You know, it's one of those. Sure. And so yeah. I'm an, I have to I have to I have to get over that hump and kind of go for it. It was one of which is which is horribly depressing because all I do is write about horrible things happening to people. So hope I'm sure people throw out my comic books thing. I don't want to read about uh, Christopher Chance dying all the time. So I I, I I'm. Like, tumbling over rocks that I myself put on the path. Well, as as we're on uh, Columbo and, and uh, Peter Beiser uh, is uh, making the point, 
He said Peacock recommended the first Columbo episode after they watched Poker Face. Wow, what a show Spielberg directed it too. And Tom and I, I'm like, I wanted to save it for us talking on the air. I've not yet watched Poker Face. I'm hearing nothing but great things and Columbo comparisons. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I watched just the first episode. So I haven't watched, I think there's three or four out now. Um, so I want to uh, a, a caveat that I think I'm the only one who didn't go gaga over it. But I did go gaga over because I did the exact same thing you did. I rewatched the first episode of Columbo, the Spielberg. Episode. I mean, it's it's well, it depends on how you count first episode because there's TV movies. But, but uh, and yeah, that's just I mean, it's utter brilliance. Um, you know, I uh, directed I got, so wonderfully and the guy's in his 20s. It's amazing. I got my uh, my links to the SAG screeners. I haven't watched Fableman's yet, but I know that that's kind of based on uh, Spielberg's uh, early career. And I'm I'm psyched to watch it, and I certainly will before award time, and before I cast my ballot. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I am curious to see it, and I love that HBO Spielberg documentary about his whole career, and uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, really, there's a guy, man. He he's your fanboy that you know they couldn't get off the lot, and finally you know pestered enough to get the gigs. Pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I'm absolutely amazing. But yeah. I but um, as for, as for Poker Face, I uh, I. I watched it with my daughter, um, who's an old movie Columbo fan, and she cool. she got bored halfway through. Wow! Which you know, she, and I it was all very well done. It's all very cool, and I love how they're they're taking they use the Columbo font, the same font I have on my shirt. Uh, and um, but I think I think we just our expectations were too high. We need to kind of measure. It's first of all, she has a superpower. Let me that's that that's in the preview. She can tell if anyone's lying. So that kind of changed. That's very. It's a very different show. When someone well, has sort of a superpower, and and I'm glad to hear that because, as and and you know, I was young enough that when Mrs. Colombo came on and Kate Mulgrew was doing it and stuff, I I wasn't offended as I probably would have been as an adult, and I'm like, yeah, it's all right, and you know, great, you know, offended. Well, you know what I mean in terms of like that they're trying too hard to make another Colombo, and certainly making her Mrs. Colombo was like, you know, and that's like uh, Michael Burnham being Spock's sister. It's like. Really? Although she existed, I suppose. But I always, oh. I always saw Mrs. Columbo as more contemporary of Falk and probably, you know, as he even described her, a little round woman and stuff, you know, like, you know, not, not to, and again, forgive me, everybody. I don't mean to uh, do whatever might offend. I, I don't mean it that way. But I just always saw her more as your. Five minutes in. Exactly. I'm already. The letter, the letter, the, yes, the Italian Defamation League will be uh, contacting me. How dare you, sir? How dare you? All of our women are. are no, I, I thought the show was very well made and very well acted. I think she would make an excellent Columbo, as Ben Blacker famously said on Twitter, um, Natasha Leone. Uh, I, I just, I guess, I, I, I'm a, I'm an idiot. I was like, I wish this was just an episode of Columbo. I, that's stupid. That's the stupidest thing anyone can say. And again, I'm tumbling over rocks I made in my own path. When someone reads one of my Batman comics, is like, I just wish this was a normal Batman comic but I'm doing all this like crazy stuff where he's, um, you know, uh, kissing people and everything. So I totally understand that, that, that this is an unfair criticism of, of a very good show. And I apologize. Well, I'm going to get to a couple questions right away because people are asking. And um, it's funny. First of all, Mike Blacklist said that that last page of human target nine works so well being read in a Columbo <laughs> voice, but also let's, let's what get into the, it? What let's get it? let's get into the latest uh, issue of uh, Human Target, uh, number eleven. Why did you turn Tora Ice into a femme fatale archetype? Uh, I I feel like I've said this before, so I apologize if you've heard this. Um, the I the way I design my books uh, uh, is like I sort of came up with the plot. Oh yeah, God. There's some Greg Smallwood art. You just flashed up the cover to eleven, which is just perfect. It looks like a a McGuire painting from nineteen. Hey, I, I thought McGinnis. Yeah, right. Greg's channeling his inner Robert McGinn McGinnis. No question. Yeah, or McGinnis. Yeah, it's just so brilliant. Uh, I just signed off on issue twelve. I am done with Human Target for the first time in two years. Started this thing two years ago, and this journey just ended, which is I, literally today. Greg and I signed off on the final issue. Wow. Um, Exciting. And uh, yeah, no, it's it's it's. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of that book. I couldn't be. I just think it's it, it's as good as I can write. If you don't like that book, then it's okay because I can't do any better. And 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 part of that is the fact that 
Greg is taking my paltry words and turning them into poetry in his art. So um, I look very, very good uh, with what Greg's doing. Uh, but yes, uh, but going back to, to, to Ice and sort of why we, what we did with her, uh, I, well, I designed the whole thing. It was supposed to be sort of a neo-noir, uh, a, a very um, a, a noirish detective series uh, with, with, with a protagonist that was uh, based off of you know D Dick Powell from Murder My Sweet. Sure. And and I and I and I designed uh, the mystery, and I I needed uh, you know uh, you know it, it, I was going to use classic sort of noir tropes. Uh, I love using them. I, I'm a genre. I, sometimes I write genre, sometimes I deconstruct them. Sometimes I like just write down the middle. This is kind of a little bit deconstruction, a little bit down the middle. And I was sort of looking for a lead character to be with chance and also against him. And my son's favorite, my son, who's now eight, he was six back then. Uh, his favorite superhero in the world is ice. I don't know why that's just the one he's drawn to loves her. And you know, like, like we'll watch Justice League Unlimited episodes. Just look in the background and see if Ice is there. And so I, I, I wanted to tell him that I was writing Ice just so I could brag at the dinner table that I was doing. Because it would constantly be like, oh, I'm writing Batman. Are you writing Ice? Who the hell are you? You're not writing Ice. You're not a real writer. So I just wanted to be a real writer for my son. Uh, so uh, I, I threw Ice in into as, as a thing. Um, and the first time... I got art back and saw what uh, Greg was doing with her. That the sort of the first splash on two, uh, I think I think I saw it before, before I saw the cover of two, which is amazing. I was like, oh my god, I'm. It, it, you just, he 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 drew someone you had to fall in love with, and I knew the chance of fall deeply in love with this person, uh, and uh, and I knew you know in, in all noirs, love is always a, it's always a double edged not double edged sword. It's, it's it's love comes with danger. That's that's part of the genre and part of what makes it fun. Um, so I turned to it. She's, I wouldn't say she's a typical uh, noir a, a, a femme fatale. I think, I think the, mo the more typical femme fatale, you think of someone who's sort of, there's the good girl and the bad girl, and the bad girl draws the, draws the main character into doing something evil. Um, it, that's not what she is. But yeah, she has some of the characteristics of, of a femme fatale. So that's, that's how it evolved. It, it, was, it was a character to put in here. And it was just my son suggesting it. And then I, I felt I liked her background story. I liked that it had bizarrely changed. They had re-upped it in this weird way where she started off as a very innocent, nice person. And then they re-upped it with this horror, with kind of this horror behind it in the 90s when everyone had to be horror and dark. And I had the contrast between the two of them, I thought for, made for a delicate character. I liked that we could balance her with fire, who was a much more typical femme fatale. So you could have yes. them, those sort of light and dark. Um, so there was there was just a lot to dig in there. And I like that she was like so powerful, but seemed to hold it back. And that everyone assumed she was so sweet. And yet there was something in her that was not sweet. And and so that that made her a very interesting character and someone for for chance to sort of fall head over heels for love. No, I hear you, man. And I and I uh, have told you before as well. Uh, I've always enjoyed Ice as well, but the uh, the way that Greg draws her, I fell in love with her. I mean, I really did. I mean, I, how can you not? And and uh, I think the way that you patiently spun out the story and everything too, uh, but but the whole time knowing that it's a noir and it's like watch out for the girl. Always got to <laughs> watch out for the girl because something might happen. And uh, no, I I think it's great. How much is uh, have you heard from uh, Eddie Muller or Cronenberg about Human Target? They've certainly enjoyed previous runs of yours and i would think this is so well, up those guys alley. are friends of mine they'd lie to my face if they hated it so i appreciate that their but their opinion means nothing because they're just too nice that's <laughs> what the, what good would it do to me i'm your friend and friend. i'm telling you yeah but i mean it's so, uh, yeah, yeah your opinion means nothing too john you're also I useless i understand i totally yeah understand. yeah it's terrible that's, that's I, I can't listen to a word you say because i like you and, and, and we text each other this so, is true we call seriously. each other absolutely yeah. i call you you know. My wife, every she reads one of my comics and she tells me, oh, Tom, that was a really good one. I was like, that's good. It means nothing. It's just because she doesn't want to get the, you know, like, uh, but I appreciate it. <laughs> she's home king king. I understand. She's, she is. She's definitely, stand. she's a homer. Yeah. She's oh, I, I, uh, Daniel Ross, it slaps, Tom. It does slap. Absolutely, man. I appreciate that. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, I love that, but I can't believe it's ending. I don't want it to. It's one of those books you don't want to end because I know every time an issue comes out, it just like a, a pouring of love happens. Like people are just like, "Oh my god, I can't believe what Smallwood did." I can't believe, uh, and and the ending is very. It's it's 
it's nice. It's good. It, 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 we, we, I, I feel we landed it. Maybe we did. I, I, when I first read the lettering draft, I felt like it was missing a little bit of a gut punch. And I, and I managed to fix it this week. And I was like, phew. Um, so now it's, it sort of has, yeah, I think it hits hard. It's, it's satisfying and, and bitter and sweet and all the kind of notes I'd want from the end of a, of a, of a good a good long uh, noir story. Yeah. That book is good because there, there are funny parts. I got to do funny. I got to do booster. I got to do yeah. uh, Nort. I got to do Nort kick a guardian, puke on a guardian and kick him in his face. Like that doesn't happen in every noir book. Like that's cool. Uh, so th that, that book has just been an utter, an utter dream of a book. Wow. Yeah, you, that, it was... you, you get gifts every once in a while. That was a gift. Just a well, gift. and it was great to take a tour of uh, Justice League International and just kind of go through the ranks and everything and, and we see Rocket Red and Nort and all these guys and, and women again. Fire was terrific. Fire. God. All right. So, you know, I, I don't know. I guess maybe Ice would be like somebody like, you know, Lauren Bacall when she's still blonde. I'm yeah. trying to think. Ice would be, oh, Ice would be uh, Ava Gardner. Yeah, Ava Gardner. Ava Gardner's got a little more edge to her. I, I maybe maybe uh, Veronica Lake. You know, maybe a little lace. Maybe maybe. Um, I don't know. Uh, what am I thinking of? Who's, I like uh, Veronica Lake. Be That's Betty Sutton. You know, like someone even even nicer than that. Oh, um, Betty Hutton. Not Betty Hutton. Sorry, minute now. Yeah, Betty, Betty, Betty Hutton. Yeah, Betty Hutton. You know, like, I you know, and I and I love Vanny. Get your gun. Uh, and man, that poor. No, one. not that Betty. No, the one the one who was married to Cary Grant. Um, sorry. Oh, oh. Um, Oh, I remember. I remember. Oh, I know. Yeah, the heiress. Um, Whatever. I can't. Think but, of but but yeah, like I. I, Bar I Barbara Hunt. No. Barbara Hunt. Yes. <laughs> I don't remember now. Two old men trying to think. We're ghosts talking about ghosts. This yeah, Carrie. Yeah, Carrie Grant's ex-wives. And then um, the, if someone came with Diane Cannon, that would be impressive. Barbara. <laughs> I think it is Barbara Hutton. Barbara Hutton. Yeah. I, I, you ever? Hear I just watched a Barbara Hutton movie yesterday, and she's she's. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Or um uh yeah that's so that that those would be pretty good. Oh, this is interesting. Mike was wondering, was there ever any temptation to use Mister Mir Miracle? Because certainly he was part of that jail, uh, the original Justice League group. Uh, but use him in Human Target. It's a fantastic question. No, I know there was never a temptation to use it to use him. I know that that sort of Barda and Miracle. I I think they're even on the splash in one, but I. It, I don't want to return to those characters anytime soon. Um, even in, in in Danger Street, where we're using new gods, uh, yes. where you're, see, you're seeing High Father and Dark Side, and and you'll see a lot of Orion coming up. Uh, we we don't touch on on Scott and Barda. I, Mitch and I did our Scott and Barda, and it's almost like I, I don't want to. Um, to to me, it's just a perfect diamond, and if I touch it, I'll put my fingerprints all over and make it shine less. Uh, so so, so I, I want it to be by itself. Yeah, so so it, it was it was it was not tempting. Uh, 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 Nerdette uh, says congratulations on uh, the big news, and uh, in fact, if you don't mind, and we might want to just get it out of the way. Oh, Christopher uh, Zuma was wondering in Dangerous uh, Street was that Warlord? It absolutely. Hell yeah, that was Mike Grell's Warlord. Absolutely, and it is Travis. It's not the Sun, and I, I love Danger Street. We will get to Danger Street talk, love everlasting talk, the new trade. When is the new trade coming out? Uh, uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, Love okay. Everlasting. That's the one thing I want to sell if I come on here to sell something. Do you want to, you want to sell now? Love Everlasting. You want to no, sell? No, no, but no. I want to go back to, to before we leave uh, Human Target, I want to sh shout out uh, the original JLI team of Dematis and, and, and Giffen. Um, and McGuire. And McGuire. Uh, that's a perfect comic book. Please go back and read that comic book. The original JLI is wonderful. I, I, I just listened to your interview with Keith Giffen. I know that was from the New Fifty Two days, but but I, I I can't tell you an influence that man has on my career. And he was very kind to me in my getting my career. Very nice. And and that guy is a giant. He's almost an unrecognized giant. How big he looms and how good he was. Um, so so if you enjoy Human Target, go back and read some of that Keith Giffen uh, uh, '80s stuff. I mean, he's such a brilliant brilliant writer. And yeah, Mark De, De Mateus always says. That no, they co-plotted that thing, you know, together, uh, and uh, you know maybe you know Mark was doing more of the 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 dialogue, heavy scripting, but you know, I Keith go back to Legion of Superheroes and his five years later arc. Uh, I, I think no, brilliant, brilliant creator. I'm just bummed, and I get it. He's he had done so many conventions and panels and stuff, and and I think he's still good to fans on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but he doesn't want to he doesn't want to be bothered anymore. 
and that's why I don't. I'm I'm thrilled I got him when he was still willing to talk. Well, Keith has had. I mean, I think this is a secret. He's had some health stuff, so he's 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 putting him. You know, he, uh, he's doing dealing with that stuff. But um, but there was no better person on a panel than Keith Giffen. If you were on a panel with Keith Giffen, just surrender. Let him take over. Why why even raise up? He was the best, the best panelist I've ever been on. The biggest laughs, the funny. Keith, 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 oh man, I probably told all these Keith Giffen stories. I'm gonna tell him Go again. For it. Do it. Uh, I, 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 Keith, I was on a panel with Keith once, and, and they asked him, "How did he do Legion of Superheroes?" He said, "He said, and Paul Paul Levitz was also on the panel, and they were sitting next to each other, and they hadn't worked together in thirty years or something." And he goes, "I would go into New York, you know, from Jersey. Uh, Paul would give me the script. I take the bus home. I'd read the script on the bus. I throw out the script. I'd go home. You know, maybe I'd have a few. What I remembered, I drew. <laughs> <laughs> what I remembered, I drew. Wonderful." So, I, I was on another panel where someone's like, like, oh, Mr. Giffen, how do you feel about Lobo, the thing you created that's spreading? He's like, I hate him. Lobo's a stupid character, and you're stupid for liking him. Yes. And I was like, I was like, oh man, this panel just got interesting. Yes. No, I, I do. It's Lobo was created to be a joke, a parody of what was happening in Image, and it kind of backfired. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, boy, I'd love to see Jason Momoa and uh, and uh, Keith talk about Lobo sometime. You're an idiot. You're a giant idiot that can snap me in two, but you're I an think idiot. Jason Momo and Keith would get along wonderfully. They both seem like no bullshit kind of guys. I think they'd have a good time. I think those two would have some beers and have some fun. I understand. So, Tom, we planned this weeks ago, and then all of a sudden yesterday, you know, James Gunn finally, uh, true to his word, uh, discusses the first 10 movies. It's been a weird few days, John. Problems. It's been weird. It's been weird. I bet, buddy. And no, we're all excited here. I'm going to put it up. There it is. Boom. Uh, there's the slate, just like uh, the Marvel uh, movies and TV. You know what's coming. Wow, look at that. And uh, it's pretty cool. And here, now I want to, before we get into it, I want to quote um, James Gunn and what he said to Don't the go. IO9 people. Where the hell is it? Where the hell is it? Good, good. You lost it. Gushes. You told me you were going to say this quote, and I rejected it beforehand. I no, no, he, it and I did not want to hear any of this. He, he gushes about uh, our own Tom King. About John Suntress. He's a big word balloon fan. Says nothing about this. That's what he says. Absolutely what he says. nothing. He no, gets on there. He's like, did you listen to the Neil Adams episode? John got him to talk about the earth shrinking. The earth shrinking. I'm oh, sorry, uh, growing. Growing. I got it backwards. He, um, he, he, no, he, he had nothing but great things to say about Here it is. Who is helping you build uh, this overarching saga? And he said, Tom King has been my partner throughout all of this. He was giving me answers to shit before I took the job. So me, him, Crystal Henry, who worked on Watchmen and is doing Waller, Christina Hodson, who wrote The Flash, Drew Goddard, who you guys probably know. We all know Drew Goddard. Uh, Jeremy Slater, who just did Moon Knight. That group of people we've been meeting and, you know, putting all this together. So with that said, uh, tell me. Uh, how it's been? I know, I know, I know. There are a lot of NDAs. So let me, in general, ask: How has it been working with James? Just, just what you can generally say about the experience. Yeah, I mean, this is terrible because I can't talk about anything. So I, I you're just going to hear me saying incredibly positive stuff. But just because, but it's all fucking true. So I just want that to be up front. That, that I mean, James Gunn is a genuine comic book nerd and reader. Someone who's been in it since he was a kid and passionately cares for the DC universe and understands the DC universe, understand what makes it cool, uh, uh, how it can be better, you know, what worked, what did. he's just a he's a cool nerd, which is a a, a wonderful contradiction. Um, and on top of that, he's a guy who has been, you know, with him, he's friends with him and Kevin Feige are not like rivals; they're they're buddies, and and he's been inside the Marvel machine and saw how that worked. And 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 saw how it created amazing things, and I mean the um, the stone, you know the uh, the Infinity Stones debuted in Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean it started with a with a movie that he wrote and directed. Uh, so it's it's been an utter joy working with him, uh, and 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 yeah, I I, I I have nothing but positivity. Of course, you're going to assume I'm going to say that because that's what I would say, but it's actually honestly from my heart true. Uh, uh, it, it's, you know, when I was, when I was growing up, um, 
uh, we read comics in secret. You know, we, 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 we got kicked in the face if you had comics in your backpack. You weren't cool. Uh, it, uh, the bullies would make fun of you. It, 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 was, it was something you sort of kept to yourself that you were reading comics. Um, and, and as I got older, it, you know, it, we, more of us, so many brave people, I was not one of the brave people, but, but other people said, no, comics are awesome. And they came out and they, and they said, we, this is, being a nerd is awesome. And I joined that bandwagon. And, um, and it's so cool to see people who, who, who live that life, who, who, who were nerds from day one, uh, now projecting that love on, onto such a big screen. And, and, and he's, he's he, I mean, the, the best way to say it is that James Gunn is, is one of us and, 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 uh, and it's going to be awesome. Well, that's great. And I knew once uh, Patrick Schumacher was teasing him in a good way in the Harley Quinn animated series. And I asked him about it and he's like, oh, no, Chance loved it. You know, and I, and, and I assumed as much, too. And again, you can tell from his movies, uh, as someone else said, uh, Peter Beiser said, happy to see your talent as seen in the wide and far. Uh, Tom, you get it. James Gunn gets it. And it's pretty obvious. So I think I think that's terrific. Um I, uh, I, I'm uh, now I do have to ask just in terms of, because obviously it's part of the slate of projects, uh, is what a, what a wonderful thing that, uh, w w woman of tomorrow, your wonderful Supergirl arc, uh, with, uh, and now I'm going to say your name wrong. Is it Bill Quist Evely? And the world says Bill Quist. My understanding is that it's Bill Keys. That would make sense. Bill Keys. I uh, want to say right. Bill Keys. I apologize, but what a great story. And now she's. Call me and be like, Tom, no, you're way off. <laughs> like like Mitch calls me after every interview and I do his name wrong. Garrett's. Garrett's. Ger Gerard's. Yes. But is yes. it Garrett's? Is it Mitch? It's Garrett's, right? It's Garrett's, yeah. Garrett's. All right. I, th I thought so. Okay, there you go. Or uh, Olivier Coipel. And it was great because uh, we had dinner one night after a C2E2 uh, day. And he's like, it's Coipel. And I'm like, good. I don't want to call you Coipel. Oh, you my God. It's Coipel. <laughs> I didn't even know. I've, oh, my. Well, it's it's Coipel. it's Mikhail Hanin. Like, like, oh, uh, that's great. Like, kind of, and another wonderful, brilliant artist that, of course, we we will murder his name uh, being American and everything. Yes. So. Yeah, but, but yes, uh, 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 Bill Keys and I uh, were, were fortunate enough to work on this beautiful book that's being in, turned into, in, into a movie. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of this little Supergirl book. Uh, it's it, it's amazing. Oh, someone's put up a comment here. What I love about James is right. And he knows how to use comedy to enhance the drama. He doesn't forget to make stories fun, but he knows how to make them scary. Yeah, that's, that's, that's dead on. Care, you care about the characters. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well said. No, Mike. very good. I, I mean, I, I watched uh, uh, Guardians with my kids and I have an eight-year-old and I have a 14-year-old and they both loved it. And that's, I mean, I, my cynical 14-year-old who doesn't want to like things and my wonderful eight-year-old who gets bored by, uh, you know, anything that's not flashing lights. They, they both, so it's like, he can, it's, it's a multiple level thing. That's what you have to do with, with great movies. Well, you know, I, uh, about uh, James Gunn, I love the holiday special. Uh, yeah, but, with Kevin Bacon. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And, you know, listen, I mean, Kevin can sing, and there was a nice ballad at the end of the thing. But the old 97s doing, I don't know what Christmas is, but Christmas time is here. I am a jaded old DJ that had to, was forced to play Christmas music and be surrounded by Christmas music for 20 years of my 30 year career in broadcasting. And I hate Christmas music. You I hate that, Christmas music. I, oh I my God. Hate Christmas. I love Christmas music. That's I, like my, my one I exception. My one exception it. is a Charlie Brown Christmas because that, that is just beautiful jazz music and really very pretty music. So that is my one exception. I now have a new exception because the old 97 song at the beginning of the guardian special is hilarious and it's a great power rock song. And I yeah. used to see the old 97s in the 90s all the time when I worked for uh, the rock station here, WXRT. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the old 97s. That's fantastic. And it, and it is. It is my it is my favorite current Christmas song. And it, I love it. it. It just was it killed me. Very, very funny. We, we, uh, it went immediately on my Christmas playlist, which is very long and gets played over and over in my house. Much to my so, kids. So is... Uh, and again, right, all right, already I have forgotten uh, how to say Bill Keese's uh, name. Bill Keese, you named it. You nailed right. it, as far as I know. Uh, so Bill Keese has to be over the moon that uh, you guys are adapting uh, the Supergirl movie. Or Supergirl. Yes, movie. yes. And I couldn't tell her until yesterday, so I felt so bad. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you. Um, but but uh, yes, it, she, she is over the moon. Uh, uh, she's the best. She's just a very kind, cool person. And Guy, I'm I'm gifted to work with just the best the best artists in comics because I, I was looking. I mean, I have the 
the trade right here. I was, I, I was just glancing at it just because a lot of people were reading it and I want to be like, oh crap, did I mess it up? And the, the art is stunning. I mean, even that one image, that final image, I mean, I had nothing to do with this cover. Like literally I didn't, what do you want on the cover? I, don't, I think I was going to ask. So, but, but like, that's exactly that moment where she's utterly lost right before she gets up and it just captures it both in her face, but while doing these, you know, these backgrounds that are from fifties and sixties, seventies sci-fi. And so, so it goes from the abstract to the exact in one image. I mean, it's just basically, and the, the colors are by Matias Lopez, um, who one of the best colorists in the business and nobody colors Bill is better. So yeah, I, I, this is another, much like Human Target, this is an art book that has some of my words on it. It's wonderful. It's just a brilliant, brilliant book. Well, you've always you've always had that touch, man, when it comes to your stuff. And I think that's wonderful that, uh, you know, you you get great collaborators. And we mentioned Mikhail uh, Yanin as well uh, in that list. And Mitch, you know, great, it, great stuff. It's hard to start, like, pointing out what other people did because at some point you sound like you're giving an Academy Award speech and you're actually, like, trying to point to yourself. But I do what – I like, that that – be, that book began as me pitching a Lobo Supergirl book. And it was my editor, you know, uh, Brittany Holster and Jamie Rich, who were like, no, take Lobo out and make Supergirl the Rooster Cogburn character. And and so like it wouldn't exist without without Jamie and Brittany. And also the best issue in their issue six, I turned that issue in and it was crap. And they told me to rewrite it, which is a hard thing to tell a writer who's as stubborn and, and arrogant as I am. And I threw out an entire issue. I was grumbling and cussing and I rewrote it. And now it's, issue six is the heart of the whole thing. So th not only is it drawn beautifully, colored beautifully, but the editors of that book made that book. I, it, it, it's one of those that survives because of Jamie and Brittany. It's, it's, I, 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 I'm just got the best collaborators ever on that thing. I hear you, man. Radium theater Productions. But the letters by Clayton are terrible. So that's the one guy I leave. <laughs> Clayton's Super the best letter in the business. I only work with him. I just feel bad because I torture him. Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow Radium says, it's probably the most beautiful book I've ever read. Magnificent art and colors. Can't wait for an absolute or original hardcover. Yeah. Well, um, or well, maybe we... over, maybe an oversized hardcover because he said OHC. I'm not Chris Marshall. I'm not uh, hip on my various uh, beyond original graphic novel and some other uh, obvious uh, acronyms for uh, comic book publishing. So I'm assuming OHC is uh, oversized hardcover. I mean, just to, uh, I don't know, brush some dirt off my shoulder. I mean, when, when that book, when Brittany, the editor and I first, you know, got together, like, you know, people like, you can't have 12 issues. It's eight. Nobody wants to buy Supergirl. Can't have a hardcover. Nobody wants to buy Supergirl. Today, it's the number one best-selling graphic novel in the country. Brittany oh, was her editor. I, you know, I, you know I was, I was, Supergirl has power, man. She's awesome. She's an awesome character. She has she has real legs and she's really cool and she's different than Superman, but she's also she has that hope stuff, but she has this sort of trauma and difference because she grew yeah. up on Krypton. It's 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 an absolute wonderful character. It's wonderful that she's shining in this way. Completely agree. And it's funny when I was uh, looking for what to grab for a cover, I'll, I'll go online and cut and paste and everything, and uh, you know do that. And I went to eBay and it was so funny because yeah, man, I think uh, a lot of those key issues are uh you know sold out you know people were selling them just for regular uh price and now all of a sudden that that series is uh eight key issues that i think people are going to say collectors are going to have to grab that before before the movie and stuff that's wonderful and it's funny that that book it didn't sell that well in 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 single issues but there were just a few people online um who were touting it over and who had read it and and, and kept bringing it up and, and those people have I mean I said this I said this on Twitter but like th that was a book that could have easily been lost and the reason it wasn't lost is because the fans came and picked it up and and, and shouted that's not the first time it's happened here they the same thing happened with Omega Men the, the same thing happened um, uh, with Vision so 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 absolutely stunning it, it was a fan saved book you know so it's great. No, that's it's, awesome. It's nice, man. it's nice when the fans win. It's nice that we have good guys win every once in a while. That's good. Every now and then. Absolutely. I agree with you. Um, oh, uh, Jared wanted to know anything you can tease about the Batman Brave and Bold coming uh, soon. The comic book, not the movie. Woo, I was it's like, no, book, the, the movie I can tease nothing. Um, what can I tease? Uh, it, it's a completely unoriginal idea. Uh, I've gotten a lot of original ideas. This won't be one. 
That's the film. I'm talking about the comic book. No, I realize that, but I just have it as a brave and bold image. Yes. But go nice. on. So, uh, so Damien will not be. Uh... No, uh, not in the comic book. No, this is a Joker Batman story. Uh, you've seen a thousand Joker Batman stories. This is another one. Uh, it's a, it's, it's something you also you've seen a thousand times. It's Joker Batman in the beginning of their careers confronting each other. Um, I've written a lot of original things, a lot of new. Inf- this is not that. This is this is me doing um, uh, and a, my version of Yesterday, a song that's been covered a thousand times, but trying to do it and trying to do it brilliantly and wonderfully and perfectly. Um, or or, or uh, that th- th- that's how I think of it. So we're t- we're taking. Um, ele- elements of, of, of a lot of Joker stories and Mitch Mitch challenged me he said can you make a scary story like that's all I want I want to be scared by a comic uh, and we're coming off of this Riddler story we did which was very dark and um, yeah. and 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 purposely left you with sort of a haunted feeling and so we're gonna this is kind of a parallel to that it's 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 um, where Riddler was all very controlled and planned this is chaos and blood so yeah, it's 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 a it's it's pure. Like I said, sometimes I deconstruct things. Sometimes I run straight down the middle. This is a straight down the middle Joker Batman story, told as well as I can. I like to think of it like you know, like you know, sometimes chefs cook very elaborate things, and, and and you judge them by the incredible components. And sometimes a chef is just like, here's a steak. You know, people have cooked fillets for four thousand years. Here is my version of that. There's very little mistakes that can be made because there's very little that could. This is my version of just a perfect you know, seven ounce filet that's going to melt in your mouth because it was cooked with incredible detail and care. Excellent, man. No, that sounds great. Lewis Headache wants to know, uh, will there be, and I would imagine it's a foregone conclusion now that the movie has been greenlit, will there be a deluxe edition or hardcover of Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow? He bought the trade paperback. He's surprised there isn't a hardcover. I mean, I, all I can say is I hope so. That's beyond my pay grade. Uh, I texted them today because it's out, it's sold a lot of, a lot of stores were uh, DMing me that it's sold out at the stores. Um, so if, if you get to get your comic book stores quick, because it's gone and it's gone from Amazon now. Um, so it's going to be now going to be expensive on eBay. So, so get to your comic book stores, get those copies that you can and, and spend some money in the stores. And, uh, I, I texted DC today to, to, to hopefully get them to, to print a new, um, a, a new version of it so so that we can get get more copies in the hands of more comic book stores so they can sell them. uh zach wanted to know if brave and bold is going to be ongoing or a limited series it's a four issue series uh hope hopefully at the end you'll so you'll there's going to be a, a bunch of trade options for how we, we do one bad day um you, you can buy just the individual issues as a trade you can buy the whole thing as a trade you can get this but but we're also going to try to do a trade that'll be one bad day plus these four issues so you'll it'll it'll be because one bad day is three issues, so it'll be like seven issues. So it'll make a good like kind of horror trade for for Mitch and I to follow all the hopeful, wonderful, soft stuff we did with Mister Miracle. Now there's here's here's the other side of that coin. Yeah, it, it's 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 four issues. Each issue is twenty four pages, and Mitch is drawing them right now. He just sent me a page. Have I said enough good things about artists yet? Um, but I, I, you might have noticed that Mitch never stops leveling up. Um, I've worked with him since Sheriff of Babylon eight years ago. Every single project we do, he just levels up another level. And uh, I don't know what the sky is on this. I assume at some point he'll be, they'll ask him to repaint the Sistine Chapel when he's 60 years old. They'll be just like, oh, you've leveled up. Now you got to go over Michelangelo. Uh, so, I, but yes, as, as usual, Mitch has leveled up once again. And the art you will see will be frightening and beautiful. Excellent. That's great to hear. And I, you know, I'm due for a new talk with Mitch. It's been a while. So I gotta, uh, you know, I always I gotta pick on him. He's he's uh, Carl Urban with a different beard, not not the way Carl Urban looks in uh, the boys, but uh, yeah, he could, you know, he could cosplay Doctor McCoy all day long if he shaved and everything. So, with 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 a shout out to Walt Simonson, Mitch is the best person in comics. He's the kindest, oh, he's coolest. sweetheart. Nice. And so is Walter. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's hard. If I had to choose between the two of them, it would be a fight between just like I don't know, just 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 someone who brings. The heart who 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 is who is the beating heart of what comics should be. You could put I I would say Walter and Dave Gibbons were the two nicest guys in comics. Oh, Dave Gibbons, yeah, so, what, yeah, wonderful. Hey man, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm like me and my soul, cynical, dirty heart. Like they they actually <laughs> put positivity out into the world. God forbid. I'm psyched next month. Dave's uh, autobiography is. Uh, I know, and I'm, I'm very uh, excited. Me, I've I've set the table. We haven't set a day to talk yet, 
but I've set the table and I'm like, you know, you, you did tell me about this six years, six or seven years ago. Now that it's finally done, please. And he's, you know, he's like, of course, John. So well, uh, I, I have interviewed D- Dave Gibbons. So you now you have a competition. So you, I've thrown down the gauntlet. See if you can interview as well as I did. And I did it. I did not mention Watchmen in our entire interview. That was the that was the challenge, and I did it. So let's see how you do. It. <laughs> well, I always uh, lean on uh, the originals because oh, that's, the originals that's, is good. Oh, it's that's so good, good comics. That's really absolutely, good comics. absolutely. Radium Theater says, and I agree. And it's going to get into some questions about Love Everlasting. As we said, the uh, first trade, the first arc, coming out uh, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, get in those stores. Radium loves the covers. Well, I love the covers and the interiors. I think, uh, you know. uh, Elsa's killing it. Yeah, Elsa kills it. uh, That's that's the cover for issue one, but that's not the cover we went with for the trade. We we went with Elsa's wedding dress and shotgun, which I I think is my favorite image. (laughs) Although I I like that one, yes. That you guys got uh, people to do as well. Oh, yeah. will they be in the trade? Will the variants be in the trade? The variants will be in the trade. I have copies of the trade. That it's beautiful. The, yeah, the variants. Are the variants? I think the variants are in the trade. Yeah, um, yeah. That's my that's my beautiful baby book. I work on that book so much, uh, mostly because it's 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 doing its kind of rounds, not rounds in Hollywood, but you know we're we're working on the Hollywood version of it. So I was just on the on the phone today about that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I I adore Love Everlasting. It's sort of my little passion project. Um, and Elsa is killing it. Uh, Elsa and Elsa help. Elsa has been my partner in Substack, partner in this, and th- thank God she exists because the whole thing would fall apart without her. She she is the spine of that, that whole part. Um, from uh, my Patreon page, everybody, patreoncom slash balloon. If you can help out the cause, it would be greatly appreciated. It's another place that people can ask questions. Cole, Cole, yes, I am a Patreon member. I am a paying. I. I pay, I pay 15 bucks a month. It's the best thing I pay for. Um, you are Thanks. well worth it. Of course. I, I definitely listen to you more than I watch Netflix. And I, wow. I Lord knows how much I pay for Netflix because they raise it every week. So who knows? That's true. <laughs> That's true. I just paid my yearly Amazon uh, prime fee and uh, I'm happy to do it. Great programming and stuff, but Colm wants to know, can you give us updates for the plans of love everlasting with Substack moving to a freemium model? Will future issues be released digitally? Yeah, no, we're not doing the free on the Substack anymore. It will just be the printed issues and image. So the Substack will just be newsletters, and this is why we didn't want you to pay for it because it's not that exciting. Uh, so it's it'll it'll just be you know newsletters and you know me posting scripts and podcasts and all, all that stuff. So the the actual free books will stop, um, and you'll and 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 they'll only be sort of published through Image Comics. As we go forward, uh, as to the future, I'm going to do that book as long as Elsa is willing to draw it. Um, if, if Elsa wants to take a break, and, and so we'll take a break. If not, we won't. It's it's very Elsa dependent to sort of the future of that book. I have stories for eons to tell, especially now that we're doing the TV stuff, where you have to, you know, um, work very hard on creating an entire huge backstory, and, and so you know, I had to do a ton of world building. So yeah, I, I have stories just forever and ever. I just wrote issue. 11 so we're doing the next the next arc after this after the second arc is a three issue arc so i'm one i have two more to write in that three uh, issue arc. all right and i think you're going to correct lewis when he says why the decision to make love or asking physical only starting from issue nine the previous issues are physical as well correct yes everything came out everything came out physical uh, uh, the decision why not to publish the um the the free comic on substack uh it's just it's it's a, it's 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 completely labor. It's it's because I, I, like yeah. we've been like we've been talking so far. I'm doing all the Hollywood stuff with the with the DC stuff. Um, I, I I'm still working on I think like six current books that are coming out, and um, and then I have I think four or five indie books coming. I, I did a count that it was 15 projects, um, and 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 Elsa is similarly racked. So we're just looking for room in our schedules so that we don't go insane. That's the, really the only reason, just because it's labor intensive to put something up for free on Substack as opposed to just focusing it on on one place. So it, it, it'll be over image. It's it's nothing more than we are overwhelmed individuals who are trying to spend you know a little time on, on with our families. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, and that, by the way, also answers James McGowan's 
question that he had on Patreon in terms of uh, what the digital plan would be for Love Everlasting, and you've uh, you've uh, mapped that out, so I appreciate that. Yeah, but you that, still, I mean, you still had eight free comics. That's not so bad. I think that's fantastic, and yeah, I as one person that took advantage of that, reading the story, I greatly appreciate that. That's fantastic. So, and I'm so I'm I'm so happy Elsa is getting uh, the attention and love that her work deserves and that she deserves. So, uh, oh, that's funny. Phoenix Zoo says, or Phoenix 720, oh, pardon me. I need a, I need my eye exam. Uh, that Love Everlasting <laughs> Spawn variant cover was so crazy to see uh, uh, made. He was speechless. Jo pretty. Josh Williamson and I was, was laughing. Josh Williamson was laughing at me because uh, my nerd as a little guy, and I was a little guy, geez, but, but when I was like 13, 14, I was Marvel and DC religiously. Like I did sure. not read any indie. The only indie comics I basically read were ElfQuest. Uh, sure. Great. And so when Image started, I was that asshole who was like, Image? No way, man. I only read Thor and Fantastic Four and Flash. You know, like I I didn't I didn't follow the image rev revolution. And then, and then when it sort of launched and became bigger where I might be cooler, I was suddenly 15, 16, and I had to pay for gas. And 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 go on a few dates or something, and suddenly I didn't have money for comics, so I missed Spawn. I just missed it. It went past me, and, and you know, there's 300 issues, and I'm always like, oh, I, I read like the Alan Moore ones because you know I'm an Alan Moore nerd, and I read the Neil Gaiman ones. But so like when someone's like, Tom, what do you want to put in the Spawn cover? I just didn't have the Spawn background. I didn't have that nerd. So I had to email. I was like, Josh, was like, does Spawn have a saying? Does he have a what? What could I? I just didn't know enough about Spawn. And so Josh Williamson was like, how do you not know Spawn's your professional comic book writer? I was like, I was just, it's, it fell into that hole. It's like a donut hole fell in. Uh. I didn't pay attention to Spawn until the HBO cartoon. And then I went back and read stuff. And, oh. and I love, and I'm so glad that Todd was so involved with the TV show, but that was a great, that was a great animated series, man. And I, and of course love the original. I watched that well. too. Yeah. I remember watching that as a, as the, well, I was like in college or something. Yeah. Late nineties, yeah. Yeah, late nineties. That, that's college. Ugh, we're so Good. old, John. I know, yeah. buddy. Good lord, dude. Don't even talk right. to me. I, I my my last radio job. All these people went to Illinois State, like I did, and they're like, John, when did you know? Did you go to Illinois State? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, when did you guys graduate? 2012, 2000, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I graduated in eighty. Uh, I got to do the math now. Oh no, eighty-eight. I'm like, how you doing? <laughs> I graduated in 88. We used to fax people every day. That's what we did. My father-in-law graduated from Illinois State. Um, so, uh, and I, much before you, John. So there's, there's, there's still older out there. I'm him. I'm him. Damien Navarro guy. wants to know how your health is, buddy. Are you feeling okay? Oh, Are Jesus you struggling Christ. with anything right now? How is my health? Uh, <laughs> what does he know that you don't know, Tom? Yeah, what do I know? What do I, where's my hypochondria? What does he know? <laughs> Uh, uh no no my health is is generally good i mean i could always use to lose a few pounds as has been true since i was five years old um so i'm always on some sort of diet or exercise routine uh uh but um it's good uh my mental health which i talked about extensively is you know uh, is is keeping steady it, it is this is a psychological you know putting my foot back in Hollywood is, is a psychological challenge, I would say like anything. And, um, but I have, I mean, I, six, 2016. So that's, well, that's seven years ago or something. Wow. Um, I was when it was when I had my panic attack and, and sort of went through and I really did. I mean, I want to tell people who were there who, who I was as low as you could go. Like I was, uh, I remember I, I had a panic attack in, uh, I was, I was, <laughs> I went to New York to meet with some Hollywood person and I had a panic attack in Grand Central Station and ended up like, you know, shoving myself into um, a toilet stall, just looking for some place to, I could be quiet and alone and freak out. And you're in Grand Central Station, which, you know, the bathroom in Grand Central Station is not the cleanest place in the world. And I was just like, this was my, that was my safe space. And I was just shaking because I could not get control of my nerves. Um, but through, uh, you know, uh, th through therapy, and I was on meds for a while. I'm off, you know, I was off. I've been off those for many, many years. Um, uh, therapy and, and learning coping mechanisms, doing stuff like exercise. Uh, um, the, the walls that I built, or I don't have to call them walls, but like the mechanisms I put in place are holding and I'm not freaking out. And um, 
and I'm, I'm finding ways to sort of to deal with all of this. Thank God. So um, knock on every piece of wood that I can. Good, man, because yeah, listen, you know, we're all thrilled for you about these new uh, opportunities that are coming from Gun, wherever else. And, um, you know, yeah, we, we hope that you're enjoying it. And, and I mean, we, we talked about Oh, this. enjoying it. No, 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 no. I, there's no joy in any of it. No, that's, that's not who I am as a human being. <laughs> I understand. I totally understand. <laughs> so uh, I, oh, this someone is... was congratulating me, like, congratulations. And I was like, you're congratulating me for getting up to bat in front of an audience of hundreds of thousands of people. You congratulate me after I get the hit. I haven't actually put the bat on the ball yet. I'm right here ready to strike out. That's how it feels. Stop. I hear you, buddy. Uh, ben Kaiser Music wants to know, was there a series that felt the most cathartic to write for you so far? Uh, Mr. Mir I mean, we were just talking about all the mental stuff. Mr. Miracle was a direct result of all that stuff. That was felt very, very cathartic to write in the end. Uh, you know, f funny as it is, Rorschach, which was at the height of the pandemic when I was, when the world just seemed to be utterly melting around us to write something that was like a 70s political thriller about the world's melting, which ended... No offense, but ended with with the guy uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, slicing an evil politician's throat open. Yeah, uh, uh, that was very cathartic and and felt very good at the time because uh, that was written. You know, when at the height of, when we were all stuck inside and you know there's every day there was some guy telling you to inject bleach in your arm. There's just like no hope anywhere. That 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 really got was very good. I'm some I would say probably Rorschach was was very cathartic. For me. Zach wanted to know. He says human target is lighting in a bottle to him. It's yours and Greg's Watchmen, in his opinion. Was it a hard sell for DC to do a human target series? I imagine uh, they like you on uh, higher profile things. Yes, they do. And I keep telling them that's a mistake. So uh, maybe they'll learn someday. Well, uh, go on. Yeah. I, I, it was not a, it was a hard sell. To, not, I wouldn't say it was a hard sell, but I mean, it, this is a famous story. But I, I, this was this human target started as a joke. I made a joke on Twitter about human target. The editor called me asked me if I actually wanted to do Human Target, and I thought he was joking, uh, and then he got Greg to draw it, and so then it became a book. And so so it, I, I didn't ask for Human Target. That was an editor reading a Twitter joke and turning uh, – and then ben, ben Abernathy. Um, congratulations, Ben Abernathy, because he was an original editor on The Authority. So that's where Ben comes from. And so he's been he's been in this business a long time, and he's seeing some of his work turn into huge things. Uh, and uh, ben, ben is – a brilliant editor. He was, he edited, um, uh, he, he's, he's one, he's editing all the Batman book stuff, all that stuff. You love the James and uh, that the James did after I left, that was all Ben. So, sure. so, so he, he's just brilliant. Former Wildstorm guy as well, I believe. Correct. Former Wildstorm guy. Yeah. Now he's the executive editor of DC comics. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, a, and a true cool nerd. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it wasn't pitch me, but yeah, after that, DC did approach me in my last contract and they're like, Tom, you gotta, you gotta do some bigger characters. <laughs> like it's time, you know, I, I basically, you know, Batman ended what I, 2019 or something. And I haven't done, you know, any mainstream uh, big ongoing superhero since then. So it's been three or four years of all these kind of small series. Now in that time I did do, you know, Batman one day, you know, and, and, right. um, and I did a, a Batman book with me and Marquez uh, called Killing Time. So it's, yep. you never leave Batman if you're working for DC Comics. You'll always be writing that character for the rest of your life. Um, uh, yeah, they, they want me on. They, I've been told to put on Gone Bigger books. Well, and and there, there's big. There's big. I mean, I'm I'm doing a big Dawn of DC book that's coming up. So it's it's coming. The Brave and Boulder is something else that they haven't something announced. else they haven't announced yet. All right, very good. Good to hear. Um, well, first of all, Michael Edmonds says we need you on Red Tornado. That's <laughs> why, why not. Why not? I already wrote that book. It's called Vision. It's out there. Indeed. Just, no question. Just, just read Vision and go copy paste Red Tornado. It would be the same book. You're kind. Of, I get it. Absolutely. Phoenix, They're even the same color. That's true. Phoenix Seven Twenty. Uh, do you ever look at? And it's funny because as we mentioned, Human Target. Uh, I would think. Uh, you know, he, he wonders if uh, you look at any of your comics as future scripts for movies, like what's happening with Supergirl. I would love to see a Human Target movie. I think. That's a great plain clothes with superheroes showing up and everything story. I could totally see that being an HBO Max series. That'd be amazing. Uh, that's, that's very kind, John. Uh, no, but no, I, I never look like I'm writing something in order for it to be in another medium. I grew up in comics. I, I 
comics are still when, when I go to sleep tonight, I'm going to pick up a comic book and read it until I fall asleep. I, I, I when I'm on, the, when on Saturday, when I'm relaxing, I'll pick up a comic book to read. It's still my number one favorite medium to read and my number one favorite medium to write in. And I, I'm just trying to make the best comic book I can. I, I never sort of think of it in terms of making it into a script for Hollywood. No, I'm always trying to make the best comic books. And I think, you know, um, I mean, I take Frank Miller as a, as a friend of mine. I, 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 I love his work. Obviously, it's a huge influence on me. Um, nobody looks at Frank Miller and is like, man, that guy wrote RoboCop 2. Like, you know, he's 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 Frank Miller wrote Dark Knight Returns. You know, like that's that's a bigger deal that, that, that he did comics than that he did movies. You know, that, that, I agree. That, I mean, no, no offense to RoboCop 2. It's awesome. But <laughs> but but to me, to me, Dark Knight Returns is is pure art. So that that's what I'm always trying to go for. Not that I get there, but that's what I'm trying to go for. Simon Lemire, this is nice. He says, thanks for sharing scripts on Substack. I just started a comic course at my university. Awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to school for art. So it's been super helpful to get uh, to study, to get to study those scripts. Oh, I'm glad. And, and you're like, oh God, Tom doesn't work at all. You're like, Tom makes the artist do everything. And, and, and so now you know my secret. And I wish you didn't. I wish you thought I was smarter than I am. Um, yeah, no, I, I love sharing those scripts. Um, I, it's, it's hard to break into comics because there's no set standard of script. That's a very sort of, it's, it's almost a barrier in our industry uh, that you can, it's hard to find script samples. And I remember when I was first trying to learn to write comics. And first of all, I, I got lucky because I was an intern at Marvel and my job was to read every script that came in. So I've, I had already read a ton of different scripts. But even having done that, so I knew, I knew like, you know, this Roger Stern would turn in a script and it was like, you know, two paragraphs of, of stuff. And then, you know, Kevin Smith turned in a script and it was every single thing described. So there was like the gauntlet. And so where to start? And um, and I was fortunate. Jeff John sent me a sample script of his. And uh, and then there was a book that was put out with a bunch of scripts. Which I have over there, I can't remember. But there's a, like, it's called like Scripting Comics. And so yeah, it was Jeff Johns and, and Mark Way. I, I kind of stole from both of them and mashed it into my own style. Those were the two guys that inspired me. So hopefully hopefully, my I can sort of pass on uh, what they did for me. That's really cool. You know, now I, I I understand DC wanting you to do more mainstream stuff, but I think uh, something like Danger Street is so great and also <laughs> the opposite of Main Street stuff. Well, but but I, the very I, opposite, and I love also, it. But I then again, you you had the opportunity to reinforce, and I don't know what works as far as trademarks or I know in the past uh, sometimes even putting a character on a cover to maintain the copyright or whatever for a character to exist. I remember like that's also, how I broke into comics, John, because I broke in. My first thing was on Time Warp. The reason they're putting out Time Warp is so they could keep the title. There and you go. Time Warp Anthology. And that was my first my first work. Me and Tom Fowler put it, doing a story in there. There so, you go, so man. God bless those copyright books. Absolutely. And I, I'm loving this story. And I and you know we mentioned uh, Warlord earlier. Uh, Travis Morgan, it's always great to see him. Metamorpho, it's great to see uh, this version of Starman too, and uh, everybody. You know the 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 Dingbats uh, from Danger Street uh, was a great way to start things off. Doctor Fate's helmet. It is uh, this incredible weird story that I'm I'm really enjoying. I think it's terrific. Thanks, man. Uh, that's that that's my my baby. I can't believe that book exists. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, They'll never let me do it again. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe with Supergirl selling, they'll let me do it again. But that 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 was, I mean, I, I literally was. I have the trade here. Um, I got sent this book on, in in my comps, which is the first issue specials hardcover. Which oh yeah, the classic, absolutely on, on the shelf. Got some Walter Simonson right there. Yes, um, indeed. And uh, and I thought, and I thought it was the strangest thing I'd ever read because. Because I know so much about DC history, I never heard of this first issue special thing. It's kind of a buried history because it wasn't very good. And I read the whole thing, and I was like, "How, like, how amazing are comics that like Jack Kirby could create something as bizarre as the Dingbats of Danger Street, and it lives next to Mike Grell creating something as weird as the Warlord, and that lives next to something as awful as Simon creating something called the Outsiders, not that Outsiders, but a much worse Outsiders." Um, next to J Jerry Conway redoing the new gods and, and doing something called, um, code name assassin, which has got to be one of the worst names of a superhero ever. But and I was like, how do they all live? And then all of that, 
all of that crazy stuff. And then at the very center, there's a story by, by Kaniger and Rosenberger about Lady Cop, which is an attempt, you know, a very 1970s attempt at feminism by two very old dudes um, who, who were clearly not ready for 1970s feminism. And, uh, but, do, but doing their best, they were doing their best. And, uh, and how could all these live together in, in the same world? And at this, at that time I was watching the Fargo, you know, the Fargo TV show, which I adored. And I, and it was like, Oh, the next season is going to be out when another 10 years. Cause you got to do aliens first. So I was like, I'm going to do the next season, but I'm going to do them with, with these characters. And, and so, so that's how it began. I was, I was like, I don't, and that was a challenge because I'd never done, I did a team book with Omega Man, but besides that, I usually do these kind of one, one character studies. Yeah. And, and to look at this, which it wasn't just the 13 first issue specials, because some of them were team books. So it was 24 different characters that were all going to be in the same book and not on the same team, but all sort of colliding with each other in, in almost like in, in a weird way. Uh, it, it seemed like the biggest challenge ever. And, um, and that's when I turned to Jorge Fornes and apologized <laughs> and, and said, uh, uh, this is, this is, this is going to be, this is going to be a challenge. It's a lot of characters. It's a lot of panels. It's a lot of storytelling. Cause we got to tell really quick stories really well. And, and of course, Jorge being Jorge, one of my favorite artists I've ever worked with, uh, knocks every issue out of the park. So, yeah. No, it's great. It's great stuff. I remember sadly old enough to, Remember when those first issue specials were coming out? I always used to tell Marty Pasco and Walter that uh, their Doctor Fate is one of the best things. One, of, one of the best single issues ever is the, is, is the the, the Pascal Simonson. They you know they just sold the the, the first page splash on that. Oh um, my god! And that's uh, reflected on that cover. That wonderful shot of uh, Fate, kind of in a surfer almost pose, conjuring a spell. Oh yeah, that's so, oh man. Famous nerd who just died had had it, so he he it was his estate sold it. it went on, it went out on heritage, uh, and oh god, it's I if, if I had all the money in the world, I would have bought it. It was it's just a beautiful piece of Walter Simonson art because he doesn't do the cover for that issue; he just does the interiors. I think it's a Joe Kubert cover. But yes, I, I I could go off on 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 all of each of those issues because each of them has their sort of special weirdness and wonderfulness. Um, even the Outsiders, which is one of the worst comics you'll ever read, is just wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful for being so well, bad. How about like it's the, like so bad. It's it's like Plan Nine from Outer Space. You want to read it again? And again. Well, yeah, I mean, you took the green team uh, from being its original weird, poor uh, Joe Simon, Jerry Grandetti original concept, and you turned him into QAnon. So yeah, you, you got my vote. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, it was. I mean, on one hand, you're like, wow, you know, to be 14 and to be to be three, four, 14 billion, 14 year old billionaires. That's like a cool wish fulfillment, Richie Rich thing. On the other hand, you're like. Oh man, that's a fucked up world where fourteen-year-olds are billionaires and have no responsibilities. You know, I don't know if you've seen this, John, but there are some billionaires out there who act like fourteen-year-olds, and it hasn't been very comfortable for the rest of us. Indeed, absolutely, man. So, um, it, it that was an immediate concept. It's funny because it has a very complicated plot connecting all of these pieces together. Yes, I don't know if you've read the first issue, but it's like. You know, there, again, there's 24 people, but there's a little thread that runs between it. And it came to me like this. It was just like, oh, I see. Um, Lady Cop, you know, why is her name Lady Cop? That's such a shitty name. That's something a little kid would call a, a, a cop as an insult. I was like, okay, that's the Dingbats of Dangy Street. They call her Lady Cop as an insult. And why are they called Dingbats? That's something an old fogey. Oh, that's of course. Lady Cop calls them the Dingbats. Okay, so they're in the same town because they must know each other because of that thing. And, uh, and, and then I was, I was like, what, well, what else, what else happens? What's happening in, in this town? I was like, uh, how about there's like, um, uh, you know, some superheroes and they're trying to do some, they're trying to join the justice league and they need a, 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 a they need to kill dark side. Okay. That's the new gods. I got that. And they use Dr. Fate's helmet to do that. Okay. So which superheroes? Okay. So that'll be warlord. I was like, it was just all just flowed like that. It was, it was just one day of story. So it, it's nice when it comes in that way. And is it going to be 12 issues or 13? What is it going to be? It's 12 issues. I wish it was 13. Boy, did I beg for 13. But no, it, it'll, it'll be 12 issues. I finished it. Like uh, up until about until, until this Hollywood stuff got crazy in the last three or four months, uh, I was I was writing everything all at once. So um, Danger Street was part of that. So I already wrote the whole thing. Uh, Jorge has every script up to issue 12. Uh, so I know how it ends and, and, and that whole thing. Um yeah, and that, that's why that's why when I talk about Human Target, I wrote it two years ago. You know, I finished, I finished Human Target before 
Supergirl. Supergirl was after Human Target. Wow. In of, okay. In terms of how I, in terms of how I sure. wrote them. No, that's cool. Um, Jeff wanted to know because he's an aspiring writer. How does one who isn't in the industry find or get access to the scripts like you just mentioned? Um, sources for uh, for for comic scripts. I mean, obviously he's talking about specifics, but really, I, I think you know, yeah. If you have any other uh, sources for uh, good script examples, uh, I mean, if you go if you type in comic script, uh, uh, Bendis wrote a wrote a big book about how to write comic scripts called Words with Pictures. That's a good way. There's examples in there. Um, Rucka wrote one for Queen and Country. Yeah, Rucka. Uh, most of most a lot of comics in the last five years have these special. Uh, a director's cut editions where they put the script with the comic book. Um, a lot of oversized hardcovers have the script in the back. I know my vision comic has the script in the back, so you can compare them one to one. Uh, for me, I did. I posted them on my Substack, but I think they were there for paid subscribers. I'm not 100 percent sure how that works now that we're making it free. Hopefully, that paywall just comes down and you can read them. Uh, th there are, you know, like I said on Amazon, you can buy scripts. A lot of people sell their scripts at cons. That's another way to get them. Uh, um, so they, they they are out there. I mean, if you just Google comic scripts, there's a bunch of them up here in your freaking Google machine. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, let Simon ask me a question because he wants to know if uh, I were to toss my hat in the writer's ring, what genre would I want to tackle first? Oh, I want to hear an answer. Primer for an entry. I have uh, both I ideas for both actually. Uh, I won't go into detail because I do still hope one day. And and also. Um, I, 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 the one lesson I've learned from people like Tom and, um, uh, really going back to Josh Fialkoff when he was doing his horse and buggy Western comics, he would do five page stories. Now I'm not smart enough to do a five page idea, but I do have what I think would be good one shot 16 to 20 page ideas. And I'm hoping to, uh, you know, find that, uh, artists that would uh, be available to, uh, you know, uh, realize some of these ideas, but I've got a handful of ideas I'd love to do. I also have one graphic novel idea, but again, I would never saddle somebody with that kind of assignment without being able to pay them up front. And that's, I think one of the things that's keeping me from really, you know, kind of realizing some of these ideas, but I've got my ideas. Five to eight are that's good. Uh, five to eight, I, I, that, those, those, I can do. those I just, are pretty easy. Five to eight to 10. I'm doing a 10 page this week. That's okay. Uh, 20 is the hard, 20 is the hardest. And, and, is often, it? and is that's, it? that's the format that's, uh, that's in most comics. And I wish they would change that. Yeah. Cause 20 is your brain is like, I can tell a whole story in 20 pages. That's a lot of pages. Um, and, but it's just a little short. It's, it's a little short. So it, it kind of fools you. If you're writing an eight to eight, eight to five page story, you know you're telling a short story. You know you have to get off. You know you have to get to your point fast. A 20-page story will fool you, and you'll think you'll have a lot of time until you hit that page 14, 15, and you realize, oh, crap, I don't have an ending. And, and you'll also do like, a, like, oh, I need a slow starter, and you do five-page slow starter, which five pages will fly by. You put a flash on, you put a splash on there, that, that'll fly by, especially, you know, with our, with our post-Bendis compression comics we do now. And, and then you, so you've read a fourth of your comic on one scene. Yeah, 28 is the ideal number. That's what we do for a human target. That's my perfect. Supergirl's a 24. That's pretty good. But, 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 but 28, that's, that's, that's the best. That's Well, and again, with your, creator, with your creator on stuff, you can make it as long or as short as you want. And again, a lot of these sure, are... if you don't consider paying the artist their, or their time or the colorist. <laughs> well, a, I, you, like, your desire is the only component in it. That's not at all true. I have, I have nothing but un, infinite. I have nothing but uncommercial ideas in terms of I'd want to make black and white comics. I like black and white comics. Uh, same. You same, know, same. yeah. I uh, and and um, my ideas are all original ideas. They're not. I, I, I mean, I do, I, I guess I do have being a boxing fan. I, I thought I, I have a wildcat idea that I would love to realize sometime. Oh, I, would I, set wish. It, I would set it in the fifties and uh, have people like Jim Gordon and Perry white and I Roy like Raymond, the TV detective all show up in the story as well. So that's my one mainstream idea that, uh, that is bubbling underneath the surface, but you know, but no, I really, I, I, what I, what I envision would be, like an anthology of short uh, little ideas, little stories and stuff. And yeah, I, you know, again, um, and, and the same kind of influences that Tom has where uh, uh, as opposed to noir movies, uh, old time radio uh, really emulated uh, the movie product of its era. And I think there are a lot of really tight 
well-made half hour mysteries that uh, various uh, from Jack Webb to Gerald Moore and some of these other great uh, radio actors would, would be able to, you know, put together in, you know, a 25 minute uh, format and stuff. So it's, it's kind of along those lines, but in comic form. So those are, those are my thoughts, if you will. Um, here, Phoenix 720. Tom, if you did an ongoing series of any of the characters you've worked on in your minis, uh, who would you prefer to write long term again? Is there somebody that you would like to write long term again? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's. I keep saying it's an excellent question. Uh, I, mean, I can tell you, people I wouldn't want to do. I mean, I, it's cause I've, I've told their stories. Like, I wouldn't want to do Human Target. I wouldn't want to do um, Barda. I wouldn't want to do Vision. Uh, although we had a sequel for Vision, we had a plan. Oh, uh, but. Uh, I mean, it's, it's stupid, but it, I mean, I feel like it's cheating. Yeah, I mean, I would love to work with Supergirl again. I just thought she was so much fun to write, and in her and her adventures should be ongoing. Um, and I did I did a Superman mini called Up in the Sky, and I'm I've said I'm like Snape and Harry Potter. I always want to write this Superman book, and as soon as I ask for it, someone else has it. I never get the class I want. Uh, uh, uh so. Josh, I, I was like, "Hey, is the Superman available?" No, Josh has it. No, oh, great, he'll be on it for the team. Does, you know, does he Superman available? No, Bendis has it. Okay, he'll be on it. Superman, but no, Pete Het Tomasi has it. Like that's been my whole career. It's never available. I always send a text at the wrong time. So uh, at at some point, I would like to do some some more Superman. If if but that seems like cheating, that's not like a small character. I don't know. No, whatever. That's that's cool. Um, if you want to write write Dingbats of Danger Street for the rest of the time, I don't think they'll let me. But I would I. <laughs> I would work with those guys, and I would do Lady Cop. Oh, you know what? You know what the real answer is. The actual real answer. This Tell is true because because they've already said no. So I can I can I can say that I'm doing a little series um, called Gotham Year One, which which is about yes, indeed. Uh, which is about slam which is about Slam Bradley, and uh, nobody's buying this. I know you're not buying it. I see you not buying it out there. You and I I. I this 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 to me is is like Supergirl. It's going to become big and because Hester's doing incredible out of his mind work, and uh, and I I do a lot of things that are that are deconstruction. Like I said before, this is not at all deconstruction. This is a pure, straight, wonderful, you know, Dashiell Hammett, Chandler Noir. Yes. Uh, and I, it was such a joy to write. And every time I wrote it, I was like, they'll never let me do this again. There's no superheroes in it. It's it's dirty. Um, it's about race relations. It's it's about the origins of Gotham. Uh, it, it, it's 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 about death. It's about horrible, you know, uh, incestual secrets at the heart of the DC universe. And, and, and I, if I could write that series every single day, I'd be a happy writer. It's just so much fun. Tom, yeah, Slam Bradley is one of my favorite unsung DC heroes. I loved when Ed was using him in Catwoman. I loved every time Darwin would do something with uh, Slam. I love this series, and uh, it is excellent. And sadly, I think it would make a hell of a Batman prequel. And the only thing I think as far as TV or film, and I think unfortunately, and, and no disrespect to the Gotham TV show, but given that it just happened and stuff, that if they were to ever do something adapting Gotham City Year One, they would likely have to wait a couple of years because I think people still have that fresh in their memory. And I think truly... You and Phil are handling the idea, and it's 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 further in the past, obviously, but it involves the Waynes. It involves what was seen as the pristine city and the you know uh, urban decay that's kind of under the surface. It's uh, I love it. I absolutely adore it. So I'm I'm glad that uh, you're bringing it up. I certainly had it ready with an image to uh, talk about. I, I love it, and I and I you know now is that is that uh, twelve issues uh, for that? Six issues, uh, Six. and issue four is out, so we're only two away from the big yeah, man. climax. Uh, so, but those are all those, again twenty-eight page issues, so they're they're big, they're big, chunky, beautiful issues where you get a ton of story in each comic. Uh, uh, but, John Holland loving uh, Gotham Year One as well. Thank you, John Holland. You rock. I th thank anyone who's reading that book. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's that book is so much fun because I'm using sort of this the the detective narration, just the classic. And it's, you know, talk about, you know, femme fatales, and that's much more typical of all this stuff. You know, it's about a detective and someone walks in. And that book was born, you know, that it was a very bizarre origin story where it was like, I was like, I want to combine Rip Kirby 
with uh, Chandler, with uh, the um, the Lindbergh kidnapping, uh, with the Los Angeles riots that I witnessed when I was when I was a ten year old kid, uh, and somehow mix those all together and create a, a new story of Gotham City. Uh, so yeah, that 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 book is and 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 Hester and and Jordy on colors. Whew, my goodness, just I mean they're just they're burning it up. You feel every every cigarette feels like it chokes you. Um, every dude looks like he, he can punch you in the face. You know, every woman looks like she'll punch you in the other face. It's just, it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful book. And Phil's killing it. Yeah. Phil is killing And everyone, uh, everyone on it. Who's doing the colors on, uh, Jordy, Be Jordy Belair, my Jordy old, Belair, the great my Jordy old Belair. friend from vision from we, Jordy and I've been working together for many a year and she's, she's amazing. And Phil is hard to color because he's, he's using all these like Kniff techniques of storytelling that are like next level. Um, I, it, it very much reminds me of working with Andy Kubert, like one of just the, the founding, you know, Andy Kubert's, you know, from one of the founding families of comics and just guys who, who you know, I like, I like comics and boxes because I think it's, it just makes storytelling easier. You, if you want to abandon boxes, you have to be such a good storyteller to know where the eye flows and how to do it. And very few people do that well. And very, very few people do it perfectly. And Phil Esther's one of those. Uh, I guess uh, Damian Navarro is an aspiring artist. And he says, Tom, just like Human Target, can you pitch me on one of those quick, sad Twitter stories of yours? Uh, what are these? Did I have I missed these? Is my algorithms not seeing your quick, sad uh, Twitter stories? I used to be more. My Twitter feed has gotten very boring. I apologize to anyone who follows me on Twitter. It's mostly by my books and pictures of my dogs. I used to be slightly more interesting, not very much more interesting. But you see, you see people would, would um, uh, they'd be like, Tom, uh, you should do uh, Brother Power of the Geek. And then I, I would do I would do a brother power of the geek story on Twitter, and it would it would consist of brother of the power of the geek goes to the window, looks out window, sees rain, cries, Finn. It was that was it. Like it was the same joke over and over. It wasn't incredibly original. Uh, with human target, it was he goes to the window, he cries, gets shot, Finn. You know, like that's it was. All right, there you go, man. It was, it was, I, I never said I was a good writer, but God damn it, I try. All right, Navarro. So go check out some of those uh, past tweets and uh, get an idea for there. God, everyone really would love, like, apparently, to see you do a King uh, Faraday uh, story. I love King Faraday. King Faraday. Uh, not yeah, yeah. Well, not I only new, Darwin's New Frontier. Yeah. That's yeah, and not only, yeah. I was gonna say not only Darwin stories, but I believe Paul Galassi had a great uh, mini oh, wow. back in the late nineties of, of King Faraday as well. So that would be fun, man. I'd love to do. A little James Bondy kind of thing. I've never gotten to do. I mean, I did Grayson, which was very, which was a Absolutely. little bit James. But but Grayson was like an over the top kind of. It was a little, sure. a little too. It was there's just a superhero element in it that was that made it. I mean, it's fun. Well, yeah, I love that book. Inherently, it's because it's yeah, inherently because it is Dick Grayson, and that's why I love I love the way Darwin used uh, King in uh, you know uh, New Frontier, and I do think it just like my Wildcat story. I do think it would be fun to go back to that post JSA fifties era, and and especially when the only superhero books were really Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman, and you had the backups backups of Green Arrow and Aquaman and the like back in the fifties. But they went to more plain closed comics, and I would love to see you know a King Faraday story set in the DC universe with all the famous cities like you're doing in Gotham City. But yeah. Like I said, young Perry White, young, you know, uh, Alan Scott running uh, the Gotham Broadcasting Company and not being Green Lantern, but being Alan Scott, you know, things like that. I would love to see that. So. When I was a kid, I bought all those. They, they had these wonderful volumes of DC Comics called the, the the Greatest Stories. You know, it was the greatest team up stories ever told, the Batman stories, or his Flash yep. stories ever told. And they did a volume, which I'm, I think I probably this right there on the back, but um called the greatest uh, 1950s stories ever told. And I had the 1940s volume, which is a hard which is a beautiful Jerry Ordway cover, painted cover. Um, and I had read through that. And, you know, when, when you're when you're 12, trying to understand 1940s stories is something. But they were still exciting. Like Kitty Eternity was, was cool and beautifully drawn. Yeah. And the, the Atom, I really liked the Atom, like how he's small but punching. But the 50s, it was an amazing time. And I had a beautiful Mike Gold introduction about why it was this way. But it was the book itself had like two or three superhero stories in it. And, you know, there was a there was a Superman and a Batman story, 
but it was 90 percent of it was these other genres that dc comics was way into there were western stories by alex toth and there were military stories by stan glassman and uh and, and and joe kuber's doing viking stories and just like i was like oh my god like there was so much rich material in the 50s it wasn't all superheroes yeah i remember that just blowing my mind as a 12 being frustrated by it because i wanted some superheroes don't get me wrong but uh, but that those were the first comics I read that didn't have people in tights in them, and I I, I remember just loving them. Yeah, no, and also even uh, the licenses they had, like they did a Mister District Attorney comic book. <laughs> that was a that was a big radio show. Uh, that's so funny. Uh, Greg uh, is saying too; he really would love to see Greg Saunders, the the cowboy vigilante. Hey, um, Mort Meskin drawing vigilante. Oh my god, what a oh, beautiful artist! Beautiful. You know. Well, I, I did pitch. This is even more. I didn't. You didn't think anything would be more obscure than uh, Danger Street. But I did pitch using all of the uh, '60s and uh, DC Comics Archie ripoff characters, uh, Scooter, oh, Scooter sure. and Binky and yes. uh, Debbie and Buddy and the DC and Bl uh, Blondie goes to Beverly Hills or something. Like they had a bunch. I I, I pitched a whole intricate. And they're like, no, no, Tom, no, not, not, not just no, but like never. Why did you even bring these Aww, up? These don't, true. these don't exist. I was like, no, you own all these bizarre Archie ripoffs. I want to do something with them. And Barbara they, they Freelander uh, used to edit uh, Swing with Scooter. Ah, yeah, Swing with Scooter is amazing. It's Paul McCartney and comic books. Yes, <laughs> that's a, absolutely. That's a, what a great concept. Bar Barbara was amazing. I meet meeting her at uh, Terrificon. And having her on the show a few times, oh, talking about uh, Scooter and the romance comics that she did. Uh, and man, some of the great uh, artists that worked at DC did not want to do Heroes. And right now, some of the names that are escaping me, but un like beautiful. If you look at Young Romance and some of those other great comics and stuff. Oh, my God. You know, Chris Zubin says uh, Tom King's Angel and the Ape. Why not? Oh, I have Angel and the Ape Bob Oxer pages. I can point to them on my wall. I I I, I collect those. I, Bob Oxer is one of my favorite artists, and I collect his pages. Um, he's he's uh, he draws he just beautifully gorgeous art, and 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 a great Supergirl artist too. So. Absolutely, no question. And, and a great Bob Hope artist. <laughs> like you know, like 150 issues of that Bob Hope comic. Oh. I, I I heard I was listening to your Neil Adams interview where he was like, "Yeah, I, I that was the most money I ever made in my career was when I was working on Bob Hope because I would do eight pages a day." Yes, <laughs> exactly. Very smart, no question. Uh, Phoenix Seven Twenty says, uh, "Do you have any thoughts on doing a book under the Sandman universe banner? I could picture you creating something uh, amazing within the world of Sandman." No one has ever. I mean, I started in Vertigo. Um, it's funny; it was just yeah. the um, anniversary of. Karen Berger's burger books were five years old. So congratulations, sir. Karen Yay. Berger was the person who discovered me. I wouldn't have a career without her. Um, so go buy some burger books. She's an awesome uh, woman. And I, I think has, has one of the claims to me being the best editor in the history of comics. Um, and of course I'm saying that because she found me on a flush, flush path because I'm, I'm arrogant that way. Uh, I, I wanted to do a comic thing, like raise your hand if you were found by Karen Berger. I feel like half of us would raise our hands. Like, where would we be without her? We'd have a completely different industry. So true, man. And I got to pull that trigger and finally do a longer Karen Berger interview. I only interviewed her once on the floor of New York Comic Con, and I had a great time doing it. And she could not have been nicer. And really, you're right. Since Berger Books, I've I've made a few initial attempts and haven't followed through on them. And I, I got to make that happen. Uh, Bill DeSimone from. The uh, I didn't, I didn't answer the question. So, but I, so I started in Vertigo, but nobody has ever asked me to to work in the. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of those books. Uh, I I remember being an intern in 1997, and I was an intern at Vertigo uh, as as a little 18 year old kid working the copy machine. I remember Neil Gaiman coming in in his 1997, you know, best goth outfit, and just being so intimidated watching him kind of go through. Sandman had been finished then, but he was just like a god walking th through it. I, I remember kind of following him and looking around the corner, and be like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I think those just those original seventy five issues are are some of the um. I, I mean, that's obviously the height of comics. You can't get yeah. Enough. No, I hear you absolutely, man. Uh, from the Patreon page, uh, let's see here. Oh, this is great. Strange Adventures was excellent. Other than the whole uh, helmet fin business. 
I see a lot of noir influences. Mr. Terrific, Robert Mitchum, uh, Adam Strange, <laughs> Douglas. Alana is I'm Jane. into I'm into it. Alana is Jane Greer, although the roles get twisted from out of the past. Uh, themes from active <laughs> violence, overlapping flashbacks from the killing with Sterling Hayden. Did I miss any? I really enjoy your work. Uh, I mean, acts of violence is where it started. So if, if if you've got that one, that's 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 the real big one that's in there. It's been a while since I've read that book. If I can even remember what was driving, which noirs were driving the train on that one. Um, but yeah, I, I I I think you you got a ton of them in there. Um, it, it, I mean, it's it's funny because that was a fun book to write because. Adam Strange was not the hero of that book, and it didn't become sort of apparent until issue eleven. Um, that that sort of the two other characters were the main characters, uh, and that that's a thing that happens in noir, where sort of in the third act you realize, oh wait, I shouldn't be on this guy's side. Um, so 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 uh, that that that's what I love that about that book. That's influenced by a bunch of ours. I yeah. I'm a massive Adam Strange fan, and I I was. Uh, I was glad <laughs> to see him use that. Oh, I apologize. Yes. No, no, no. Because honestly, no. You know, on it's it's so funny, man. Because saying that reminds me of the shit that Nick Spencer took for Secret Empire and making a dark Captain America. And it's like, hey, man, it's a story. Everything's fine. You know, you can you can accept. Uh, you know, it's and it's a black label story, so it's not in continuity. If someone wants to write a new space, uh, you know, hero Adam Strange story, they can do it. I don't, I don't think you've tainted the character to be used again. And that's why when, when I'd see these weepy blogs, oh, my heart is broken. Oh, you've, you've killed Captain America. It's like, relax. It's going to be fine. Wait a second. I don't accept the premise of this entire argument. Because Adam Strange, I knew Adam Strange. I wrote Adam Strange. Adam Strange, you are no Captain America. That is not. No, no, Cap but I'm just saying Captain another America example. Is John Byrne. He's, he's, he's Kirby. <laughs> But it's a uh, it was a it's he's secret Mark empire. Wade. Secret yeah. empire is a deconstruction, and that's okay. And and I mean, and he explained what happened. The Red Skull got the cosmic cube and remanipulated Cap's history. It's not Steve's fault, and the goodness of Steve still emerged and would not would not arrest or be submerged, and came out and defeated Evil Cap. And I kind of like that Evil Cap's on ice. Uh, and not dead, although maybe Deadpool killed him. I can't remember now. But um, I don't. Know. I don't disagree with anything you said, and I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that story got to, to be told. But I'm just saying that that uh, Adam Strange has never had good. Com I mean, has very, very rarely had any good comics. He's even the original Infantino Anderson comics. They're not good. They're, they're beautifully images. drawn. They're yeah. they're not good comics. They try try to read them. Lord knows, Mitch and I did. And it, it's very, and then, you know, and, and he got the eighties treatment. He got the Dark Knight Returns treatment with beautiful art by Andy Kubert, but that's not yes. a very good comic. He has an affair and it's, it's, you know, if, if you, you read it and you feel very dirty, you feel like the writer was trying to justify an affair on his wife. Like it's very, so like uh, Adam Strange has never hit anywhere near the heights of Captain America. That that's a character. I don't feel so bad that we kind of messed with him sometimes. That's all right. I, uh, I loved his appearance in Swamp Thing. He uh, was good. I have I have, I have a page of that very issue, uh, and, and that is a brilliant issue. But it's two. That's only two issues. That's true. And uh, and even that they make fun of him a little bit, where his like his thing opens up in the Australian in, in, in a toilet. That I lo I love that opening because he's trying to catch the Zeta beam, and he's like, "Where where did this ball come from?" And he's got to run into the stall. And then he gets the Zeta beam. Absolutely, man. That's but yeah, hilarious. that's those are those are good issues. Yeah, I mean, I'm not oh, gonna lie. Those they're that those are. I mean, all right, guys. Anything Alan Moore touches is gold. What am I gonna say? Hey, Barucci's watching us. Nick Barucci from Dynamite. Hearing more about hey, Adam Nick Strange Barucci. Thank you so life. much for being nice to me a long time ago. You were this. You were you were you were you were a gentleman. I appreciate it. Well, he he said he never thought he'd hear that much about Adam Strange in a negative light, uh, but that's fine. But no, thanks, <laughs> Nick. Thanks for as always. I appreciate you watching. Nick, come on the show. Jesus wait, Christ. wait a second. I, let me say, put Adam Strange. He has an awesome costume and awesome superpower. I love a dude with a jetpack. Um, so, so there's because now, now Jeff Lemire made him Canadian for a little while, so that was weird. Yes, he but, did. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, true. That's hey, man. I just like uh, okay, that's good. Nick says one day he will come on. I certainly hope so, Nick. You know, I really want you on the show. I think you got a lot of great stories to tell. 
I really appreciate uh, the characters you bring back on in Dynamite, and uh, I would love to talk about your love of uh, the sh- of genre fiction. I know it, so uh, please, you know, I bug, I, I tell uh, Joe all the time, your uh, your editor in chief, that uh, I would love to have you on sometime. So very good to hear. Excellent, I appreciate that. All right, I want to go back to the Patreon page. Um, Jonathan Schwartz, I was catching up on your interview with Ed Brubaker promoting the Reckless books. He said other creators could do what he and Sean Phillips are doing, going straight to graphic novel releases instead of the monthly format uh, to collection pipeline. They might find it to be a better use of their energy and even greater financial reward because all the hype and press is focused on the graphic novel. Uh, Brubaker mentioned in particular that a team like Tom and Mitch Garrett's would be uh, uh, probably have enough of a dedicated fan base to make that jump. Is that something, Tom, that you've considered doing with Mitch or any of the other stellar artists uh, that you collaborate with? And then I'll, I'll wait and then get you to answer that. And then I'll, I'll ask his second part of his uh, question. I, I, I've considered, I mean, the, the, the genius of Ed and, and Lord knows we all admire him for doing it is, is he established a track record, um, with Sean where they could do that, where the stores would trust them and knew what their numbers were. And I mean, that's a track record he did over 20 years. I mean, Ed's been at, at it. And, and I mean, I, 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 I read t- trades of criminal when I was in, you know, on the Afghan borders, like that's how long Ed's been going on. That's when I first read criminal. Uh, I, I was, I was still spying on people. So, so I, I don't have a track record like that, that I, that Ed has established. And if I ever do, I would, I would like to, I would like to do it. Um, I think Mitch and I could do it. I mean, obviously, like all of the burden on that is on the artist. You know, it, I, I, there's no other way to say that as a writer. It, it takes me, it would take me six, six, eight weeks to write a nice little graphic novel. It would take Mitch uh, eight months to a year to try it. And he ha- he has a child, he has a wife, he has a house, he has a mortgage, he has a life. Um, and, and that's tough with no income coming in until that hits the stores. And uh, so, so, so it, has to, it has to be the exact right circumstances, you know, for, for, for that to work. So, so I, I'm nothing but jealous of Ed. And I wish I can one, I hope I can one day take that, take that risk. Cause I think it would be, it would be, um, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a model I admire and I, and, and I, I wish I could participate in it. I guess that's what's put it. Um, let's see, uh, Subham wants, uh, you to do a sequel to Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. I would think with, uh, the coming movie, that's a foregone conclusion. And I'm saying that. <laughs> I'm saying that. <laughs> how would you, I, I'd have to figure out how to do it because, uh, it has such a definitive end. What would I bring back Ruthie? Could I use that? Cause you'd have to use that same voice again. That, that, that like, you know, that Southern Gothic voice with the too much, with all the four, $4 words, um. Is that, is that what you say? Four dollar words or some kind of ten dollar words? Ten dollar words, but I'm ten dollar. Like, I gave you discount words. That's exactly my that. words aren't ten dollar words, but four dollar words for me is still like three dollars more than most of my words. So four dollar words are like Thor and Scrabble, you know? Yeah, that's right. Door. <laughs> it's like when you put an A next to a Q and you uh, in 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 uh, uh, Scrabble. Uh, so um, <laughs> look it up. It's in the way. It's Q A. It's there. Uh, 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 so um, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, again, I. I I would love to do. I've um, obviously would have to be with Bilkis, so I, I could I could disguise uh, my writing behind her beautiful art. So it it it, it, it was it's beyond my my powers. I, I hope she does. Um, but but there you know I won't say we don't have any plans in that direction. So I, I will say there's you know there's I don't know, I, I I can't talk about it too much, but um, there's cool stuff coming. That's the stupidest answer, but there is cool stuff coming. Oh, very good, very good. Um, let's see. I want to go back and uh, see some of these other earlier questions. Um, I'm ready. The earlier questions. I know you're a good man. Uh, let's see here. Tom, aren't your children adorable behind you? Yes, that's when they used to be adorable. Now they're old. That's uh, a little adorable. Oh, this, and I'm not really sure what Greg's trying to say here, but Tom, most of your comics come out in waves with themes across all of them. That's fair. What is yeah. the current theme or ideas? you're trying to explore in the books you're writing now. So maybe without giving uh, titles away, you could give us an idea of some of the ideas you want to convey in upcoming projects, or maybe not. See what sure. you want to say. I, I mean, I think with, um, uh, uh, with, with Gotham year one, a human target, 
and and uh, Danger Street. You're seeing three. You're seeing sort of a height of three takes of my looking at of old old noirs and putting them together, and and crime fiction. Um, so so the, that that's a big theme, and uh, you know sort of the um, God. I don't, it's it's hard to say. Usually I'm 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 better at knowing what I'm writing about, but what those books have in common, um, they're a little happier. My my books for a while were very negative. Had very negative endings. Uh, not these books have beautiful ending, but Supergirl has a happy ending. Yeah. And um and I think Human Target has a satisfying ending. Like it's it's there, there, there's a little more optimism in me. I, I try to starting, you know, when the turn of 2021, I wanted to write books that had a little bit more I don't know. It feels like the world is turning, like we're coming back, you know. It feels like we were in a very dark place and now we're emerging. You know, I go into a bookstore, I'm not wearing a mask. I'm having fun. My kids are running around. It's, it's just, it's, it's joyful. And I, I, there is, there's a little more joy in my books than there, than there used to be. Um, even though they're it's like, God, your one is about the rot at the heart of <laughs> so, so not that much joy. I'm just saying a little bit of joy. Is going through. Brock Sager says I might be late uh, to this. Do you have music playlists that you put in your comic scripts? That I put in my comic scripts? Well, or, or I would say, um, do you, and I always ask this question. Uh, do you have uh, like a do you have a playlist in mind, or would you post publicly while reading Gotham City Year One, listen to this music, or Human Target, or any or anything for that matter? I would do it for Gotham City Year One just because it'll be more fun to pick, you know, early '60s music. And even though like it takes place in the early '60s, in my head it's in the early '40s. Um, sure, uh, but. Honest, I mean, I listen to music when I write oftentimes, sometimes I don't, but I'm just not, I'm not cool enough to do that. Some people like Asthmatic Fraction and, and Kelly Sue, they'll be like, yeah, here's this like, you know, Portland band you've never heard of. And, and here's this new wave band that I listened to in 1982 that had this, you know, a single that only came out in Japan. And that's to be the perfect song here. Like, uh, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not cool enough to do that. I, I, I don't know the deep cuts. Um, my kids just like twist Taylor Swift. So if you want like all Taylor Swift songs, that's all we listen to in our house 24 seven. I can do Christmas music. I did that in Bat Cat. Um, but, but no, I'm, I, I feel like my, my music knowledge, although I love music and we have it going in my house 24 hours a day. I'm just, that's not my nerd. I don't know. I, I don't do it. My brother was a musician. He was a professional tuba player. And so he, really? was music- yes, my brother. Yes. He, he since left that profession. He, he, uh, he found Jesus and now does music for his church. Um, but, but, uh, so growing up, he was the music guy, like, and so it's kind of that, that identity was taken. He was my older brother. So I couldn't be the music guy. You know, I, I remember you telling me that your brother did music for his church. I didn't remember that he played the tuba. Did he blow out his lips? No, he's still a tuba player. Uh, you can find my brother on YouTube. He has a YouTube channel. Uh, tuba Dylan is my brother and you can see him like in, um, that sounds uh, familiar now. Yes. Go on. Uh, um, like t-shirts playing his tuba. Uh, he, he has, he had one video that went viral. It has like a million and a half hits of him playing the Super Mario theme. And uh, <laughs> he'd, he'd be so excited that I'm promoting his YouTube channel. He'd be like, yes. Do you remember, did you ever see the, uh, the Schmengis, uh, uh John Candy and Eugene Levy's polka uh, characters? They, uh, they did the last polka, which was a parody of the last waltz. And uh, you see them playing live. And they have a tuba player in their uh, polka band, and he gets a tuba solo, and it's fantastic because it's just like a guitar solo or a drum solo or whatever. And he finishes, and John Candy in his schmeggy voice goes, "Come on, everybody, that was some hot tuba. Let's hear it, hot tuba." <laughs> my my brother was a very very serious serious tuba player. Uh, he's, so he's four years older than me. We didn't go along, or we were at each other's throats oh i hear you uh, man that's me and my sister absolutely um, but but so so but he started when he was in eighth grade so i was in fourth grade and since and and, and, and but but so my house constantly i lived in a small little house and it was just oompa 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 ah, ah, just ah, practicing ah, scales 24 hours a day my brother as far as i could tell never slept um and he practiced tuba all day long and he was like I, like you know he, he went to um, you know, they, you know, like fame is, you know, that movie, like the artsy college in New York, sure. there, there's an artsy college in LA. My brother went to that. He was the first tuba. So like very serious tuba player. Uh, and he got a full scholarship to college playing tuba, you know, for, for, first in the orchestra. 
Uh, I, I spent my whole high, you know, my whole life going to. I was telling my kids about this. Like I would go to so many classical concerts, you know, and and we would and we would always. My brother played the tuba, so he's in the very very back, you know. <laughs> and so I'd be sitting there, mom, be like, "Oh, look, there's your brother." He's my mother didn't have that accent. I don't know. She was from LA. I don't know why I gave her a New York <laughs> accent. Uh, but you know, there's your brother in the back, and you see, I mean, you could barely see the reflection off the bell. You know, I'd be like, "Oh, I'll sit through three hours of Mahler so I can hear in the background, boom, boom, boom." And uh, but to this day, I could tell you what a good tuba sounds like and what a bad tube tubist sounds like. So that's uh, all right. That's there it. you go, Ed Brock for uh, the uh, video audience. Oh, there the, you go. My brother's getting some hits. He'll be so he'll he'll be excited. Uh, YouTubelink.com slash at tuba dylan slash I want, I, featured. I want to be absolutely clear. My brother is 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 uh he, he moved to North Carolina. He 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 he's he's very religious. Uh uh and we don't share any politics or beliefs in religion or if he's preaching on that stuff, that's not my preaching. Just want to make that very clear that, that we're very different people, my brother. We get along, but we're very, very different people. He's I understand. He's, um, yeah. So no, I, like I said, my I mean, my sister and I politically are share a lot of the same views, but no, we're different. We're totally different people. My brother and I politically yeah. share none of the same views. We are all, we are, we are opposites. No, you know, um, again, it happens. That's all right. But he's but but, but, but he's still your brother and you love him. He's Absolutely. still my brother, and his children are still my niece and nephew. Absolutely, man. No, that's cool. Um, no, mo most definitely, most definitely. So we talked about a bit about Poker Face. And he, uh, I, I am excited for Picard season three. Saw I the preview. Very, you're the one who told me it's going to be good. So if it sucks, it's on you. You've been totally telling me that for years. That. Hey, buddy. Uh, I trust Rob Burnett. Rob Burnett, the YouTuber. I, I, he's a friend, and he is a much harsher New Trek critic than I will ever be. And he has done nothing. He's seen the show. He said he's seen all ten episodes three times now. And Terry Metalis, the showrunner, has confirmed that, well, uh, Rob knows what he's talking about. It must be so that he has seen it. It wasn't uh, through any authorization that Rob has seen the show. But, uh, you know, and Terry's done very good involved interviews about the series. It's very obvious he's a Next Generation fan. He was just on Rob's show on Sunday after the uh, trailer was released. And um, by the way, if only if you only saw it on the AFC game, uh, it's two and two two minutes and forty five seconds uh, on YouTube. So it's oh much really? Longer. I watched the one minute version. Okay, I was wondering. Okay, yeah, I want to see. No, that. it's it's very it's very good. And uh, he said it's the most Starfleet of the new uh, Trek shows, and that's a good sign. So uh, I'm I'm excited. I am. I won't deny it. I'm very excited. I will return this rumor mill, the secondhand rumor mill, and say I know a bunch of people who have seen the Flash movie and say it's fantastic. I and saw say, James say it's, it's one of the best DC movies ever. So uh, I'm 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 very much looking forward to that. Would you mind? Because I I did bring a, I do have images from what James brought up in the presentation, and again, I don't need to know your direct uh, involvement in any of these. I am very thrilled to see that Gabe Hardman's art was used uh, to illustrate uh, the plans for the Lanterns TV series. I can say nothing. I know a lot of things, but I can say nothing. I'm used okay. to it. Okay. Uh, well, I and also um, the uh, the animated show, uh, The Creature Commandos. Doesn't that look fun? You know what makes me yeah. excited about that? I mean, it's going to be fun. But uh, uh, Dr. Phosphorus right there in the center. Yes. That's a, Walt, that's a Walt Simonson joint. As I mentioned previously, Walt Simonson is one of the nicest people in comics. So to see something he created in an animated show makes me very, very happy. And and I, I know he created it because Walt, I, I begged Walt and he came and did a, story, a Batman story with me. And his one condition was we had to put Dr. Phosphorus in it. Hey, um, that's great. Oh, so, that's so, excellent. So I got to write Dr. Phosphorus. And I got to write that Dr. Phosphorus uh, killed Batman because um, he poisoned him. It was sort of a shout out to uh, Jim Starlin's How Death of Captain Marvel. Uh and so, so I'm I'm incredibly ecstatic for Walter for Walter being like creating this very bizarre villain 50 years ago, and now having it's going to be in millions of homes. That's very cool. I agree with you, man. Walter. No, I, I really again I'll, I'll speak in general and say I love uh, the ideas. Um, I I'm intrigued by a Swamp Thing movie. Uh, I think again it's always been a great uh, from the cheesy 80s movies to the nineties TV show to the DC universe TV show. I think uh, 
uh, there's a lot to be mined from a from a Swamp Thing idea. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I think uh, that's going to be really cool. Everything, I think, uh, they, they it sounds, uh, as you said earlier, uh, coming from Marvel, James saw what worked, obviously was able to work within the Marvel system and make some really great stuff. I think The Suicide Squad is a terrific movie. And he's got Sam. that combination of of action, drama, and humor that I and think. And I love Peacemaker. God, that show is, Me too, man. is so good. So, Oh, Brock wants to know, would you make a cameo appearance in the Supergirl movie if you could? And what background character would you like to play? Hilarious. Oh, my God. Only if they gave me the whatever uh, uh, a coach they gave Kumal Nanjani that he transformed. I, if, 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 the, if, if I can do a year of that so I can get the six-pack before my cameo. Oh, my God. Yeah. Isn't that hilarious? Absolutely, man. Uh, that's, uh, and Christopher also says he could see you Stan lee a cameo in World Woman of Tomorrow. No, I, I, I would, I would, I would hate. I can't stand seeing myself looking at myself live now. Can you imagine seeing myself eighty feet tall on some screen? I'd be like, oh my god, wait, I don't have hair. Why did anyone tell me I've been wearing a hat? I had no hair this whole time. <laughs> oh, this is a terrible thing. I haven't, I haven't seen under the cap in quite some time, man. It's good to see. Oh, That's there cool. it is. Still there you gone. go, buddy. Ah, don't worry about it, Jesus. You look great. I'm sure your wife has no problem with that. That's fantastic. And you're wearing your Washington Nationals cap. There's nothing wrong with that. I love that. And switch to Lakers. If you want to be oh, nice. Hey, speaking of Lakers, let me tease. Coming on the 15th, uh, the uh, co-creator of Winning Time, that great HBO Lakers TV Ooh, series. I love that show. That Roddy was, Barnes. That almost made up for the sh shitty season we had last year. That was worth it for me. I'd rather have the show than the season. Roddy great. Barnes is coming back to Word Balloon to talk about his Blackula graphic novel. Uh, I am, and he sent it to me. It is excellent. It uh, picks up. It brings uh, Blackula to the modern day. I am awesome. rewatching uh, Scream, Blackula, Scream, and the original movie in preparation and uh, enjoying my William Marshall uh, fix. Beyond him, of course, being Doctor Daystrom in uh, in Star Trek back in the day in the uh, Nomad uh, episode. Nomad, you are uh, imper. Wow. Sterilize, <laughs> sterilize. Good stuff, man. I love that. Dude, I'm telling you, and I don't you know. You're a I, computer brought to life. Are you an AI, John? Did they make I, you up? Did you did you see the nice things that uh the robot uh, power said on uh chat uh Gmail? I did, but I don't acknowledge you using that AI stuff. What is going on with well, that? Well, I listen, my friend Gary did a uh Q and A asking about me, although it did have one factual thing incorrect. I've met Frank Miller. I can't say Frank Miller's a friend of mine, he has never been on Word Bullet. And I certainly hope to rectify that. I've been bothering um, uh, Selene Thomas uh, to no end to uh, get Frank on because I even did her a favor. So I feel like she kind of owes me to get Frank on the show. You and Frank would be good because he loves Bronze Age and Silver Age comics. I think you guys would have a good time talking. About I'd him. love talking to him. I tell you my sadly my uh, my uh, Frank Miller story where I was <laughs> at my first Eisner Awards and it was man it was 2006 my first con my first San Diego I'm there on a shoestring. And I literally had like four business cards and I'd already given them all away. And I I, show, I I went to Frank and I'm like, hey, I would love to have you on. I have this podcast called Wormley. He's like, sure, give me a business card. And I'm like, I'm out of business cards. And he went, and he walked away. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, but, but Mr. Miller, come back, please. So, but it's okay. I had so many good experiences. That's when uh, uh, Rob, uh, Rob, uh, shame on me. God damn it. Rob, uh, uh, come on, uh, uh, 90s, Rob. Liefeld, Liefeld yeah. Liefeld and, uh, and Loeb are sitting together, and Loeb recognized I'd never met either of them before. And I don't I miss I, your Loeb reports. I want to have, I want to have more. Of I would love to have Jeff back. I ask all the time. I think after leaving Marvel Television, he's laying low. I met him for the first time at a con this year. He was such a nice guy. He was he's a, he's a very so kind and cool. We were on a pan, we were on a panel together with Jim Lee. And we have was... so much fun when we talk. Oh. It bums me out. Um, maybe he switched cell phones. I don't know. I'll. I don't. I never want. I never want to abuse the privilege I have of of knowing people. Some of their e secret emails or their phones and stuff. So I literally will be like every six months. Hey man, you know, just putting it out there. Would love to have you back. And he's on that list of of people like that that I haven't been on in a while. I feel like so, you abuse well, me all the time. So it's just an exception for well, me. You, I'm you, the only one you're texting three in the morning, and you're like Robert Cole. Whatever happened to that guy? <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's sad, but true. There's the night, not at three in the morning, everybody. I only during the day. Did like, you hear about Wednesday Adams? Oh, 
Oh, that was sad, man. Somebody See, I knew, I knew you would know. You poor Wednesday. My Wednesday I know, poor Wednesday. And especially with the current hype for the new show and, you know, or the relatively new show and uh, yeah. everything else that's happening with the Adams family. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. And she was young. Very young. Yes, it's very heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking year already. I don't like heartbreaking. Oh, yeah. Just to stop that. No, I hear you, man. No you, you, you have permanently broken my heart for old time stuff because you got me addicted to the Gilbert Gottfried show, uh, which so good, which was my favorite podcast of the whole last year because I've just been binging it nonstop, and um, and I cannot believe he is no longer with us. I don't understand because no. when you listen to a podcast, it's like you make friends with that person. Absolutely. You feel like you must know them because they've been in your ear and you. And the fact that I'm listening to someone who has already passed from this mortal and he's talking about people who have passed and talking about death. And I'm like, I'm listening to ghosts talk about ghosts who knew other ghosts. It's the most depressing thing I do every day. And yet it's the most fun. So I blame you for that. So fuck you. for It's a, that. it's a, it's a great old Hollywood show. Um, and yeah, no, it breaks my heart that Gilbert is no longer with us. I keep bothering his co-host Frank uh, to come on. Actually, I should say again, I keep a respectful distance, but I, I, because the last time I did, I asked you and Frank should do an obscure actor off. Oh, we have a ball. Well, he's been on the show. Frank's been on the show way, way back, and uh, I'd love to have him back. And no, he's very sweet, and he responds, and he's just like, you know, yeah, just you know, especially after Gilbert's passing, and he even confided, and not only that, he said it also publicly when he was on Dana Gould's show that that show was a grind, and you know, the only how could it not be? He he would watch if a person would come on some obscure actor and he had, would have watched their entire oeuvre. He'd be like, he'd be like, I was on six episodes of Rockford. And he's like, yeah, I watched all six of them. And you didn't you do a guest spot in this one. Like he, it was, he's a, had so much research he put into every interview. Well, but you know, it's funny. Uh, some people call it research. Frank referred to himself. And I guess a lot of people like Dana Gould, Frank Gilbert, when he was still alive, they called themselves travelers. And they are like just nerds about old Hollywood, nerd TV, comics, whatever. And so, yeah, it, you know, it's just his entertainment that he grew up on. And and yes, he did do he did do extensive research. But I also think it was from pleasure as well of, oh, well, we're going to talk to Lee Grant. Well, not only am I going to talk to her about that Columbo movie she made, the, the, the second pilot, but also, you know, a million other things that she did. And really got joy, re, you know, going over her work again. And you could say that about a lot of the the, the guests they had. John Biner, the great impressionist. Oh uh, yeah, that's a good one. You know, yeah. I mean, God, I, I was re-listening to Joe Dante uh, this week. Uh, they re-released Same. on Monday. What a great episode! Just... Do you listen to his uh, show that he does with Josh Olson? It's called The Movies That Made Me. No, no, I don't know this one. That's a really good podcast, and it's um, uh, Josh is the lead guy, but Joe is the number two on the show and they'll have filmmakers on and all they talk about are uh, movies that inspired them. And uh, they just had, Oh God, I can't think of his name. Uh, Shame on me, but they had a guy on who, uh, Oh, the guy who directed attack the block. Okay. And and, uh, he, all he talked about were the movies from when he was a little kid that he loved. And he's like, I love the omen, but I really loved omen too. (laughs) <laughs> and, I, and it was just, just these this interesting list of movies, but also um, Alex Winter uh, from Bill and Ted. Sure, yeah, he was on, and he he's, a big, pro- he's a big producer now. He produces a lot of stuff. Yes, and a lot of great documentaries. And he has a real extensive uh, knowledge of old film, uh, both classic, foreign, uh, you name it. I mean, he really is amazing. So uh, yeah, you know, it's oh, that's funny. Chris Zuman says for Dana Gould. It's uh, mostly traveling through Planet of the Apes movies. Yeah. But uh, no, Dana's another guy. Dana, in fact, when I interviewed Dana, um, he talked about how much uh, it's funny when uh, talking about old time radio. He's like, I love listening to old dragnets because it's such tight storytelling. And it is. It's yeah. it's one of the best procedurals. And not only the 60s fun one of get a haircut, hippie. I like to get dope heads like you off the street. But no, you go back to go back to the 50s TV show and go back to the 50s radio show and it's i mean it's just great police procedural stuff it's amazing so so my dad worked for webb right um jack webb's uh company jack worked webb. for jack webb wow in 1969 wow ish 
uh, he just told me this story because we were we were we were talking. So my my my, my, fa- my father was um, I don't think he'd mind me saying this, but he was kind of a failed screenwriter. He he so so he graduated from UCLA in '68. He took screenwriting class, and so he 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 got his sort of po- like trying to be a screenwriter gig was he was writing scripts for Jack Webb for Jack Webb. Jack Webb hired him to be part of his company, and so the, my father is. Uh, uh, I, I, fabulous is a good way to put it. But like you, you, you 100% trust his stories. He has wonderful stories, but some of them are 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 are, cra- are crazy. But according to my dad, um, at, at at that time, what 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 Webb would do was he was basically running the scheme from the producers. He he would go out into the valley and he would go to old women and he would say, "Can you?" And they talk to him and they would tell him their life stories. He'd be like. I love, that's a brilliant idea. I want to make a movie of your life. Would you invest in that movie? And then he would bring back these old lady stories to my father. And my father would be, have like two weeks to write a screenplay of that woman's life, whatever it was. And he said it, it was, it was, um, it was done train style. So he'd write the first 10 pages, then his like go on break and someone would come and write, write the next time until they had a full, so they could give it to that woman to justify her giving Jack Webb $10,000 and the movie would never get made. And so that was just like the running scam he had of getting, of making, of making movies of old rich ladies' lives that never hit the screen so he could get their, get their cash on investment. Right so before, that, that's a story for my dad. Right, right before COVID, Gabe went to an open house of one of Jack Webb's old houses. And there was all this like stuff, like his cocktail uh, glasses and decanter set and things like that. And he just took all these great pictures of it. No, I mean, God, again, there's a great subject for me, you and Gabe to talk about some night. And, uh, and also Andy Parks, Andy Parks is massive. Uh, and Jeff Parker, all of all massive Jack Webb fans, Jack, Jack Webb, Dragnet, William Conrad, Fat Cannon. They were like these consummate radio actors. They just had the greatest voices that would suck you in, and you just were amazed by those stories. I I, I just adore listening to their work in radio, even I, yeah. when their TV work. I used to watch a lot of Dragnet on Nick at Night when I was a little kid. I sure. I had insomnia as a child, a bad insomnia where I just didn't sleep at night, and I would just watch Nick at Night all night long. Um, and and they'd have Dragnet marathons, and I used to watch. And uh, and for me, the weirdest part was that Harry Morgan from Mash was a cop. I was like, oh, this is what he was doing before they sent him overseas. Exactly. I had to go to <laughs> but, Korea, Joe. But yeah, I, <laughs> I remember just being, I mean, I, it was, I mean, I hadn't seen obviously Law and Orders then. It was like the first procedural I'd ever seen. Sure. And, and being very taken by it and being like, man, those hippies were up to no good, you know, <laughs> like as a nine year old. Absolutely, you know, man. I had very hippie parents. You know, my name's, like I said before, my brother's name is Dylan. I'm Thomas for Dylan Thomas. We have hippie names. Oh, there you um, go. That's beautiful. Absolutely. So, uh, so, so yeah, it, it I grew up on Jack Webb and Dragnet. Uh, my favorite Dragnet, you can find it on YouTube. It's like from the 10th or the 11th season. And it's uh, Jack comes over to uh, Harry Morgan's house. Uh, uh, I forget his characters, Bill. And uh, and the wi- Bill's wife is out of town. And it's just them like bacheloring it up for the weekend. And, <laughs> uh, and all these like neighbors come over with problems. And they know Bill's a policeman, so they'll talk to him. But they have a card game. And Bill makes this incredibly gross sandwich that he wants everyone to try. And it's peanut butter and garlic on pumpernickel. What? And he's like, it goes great with beer. And uh, and Jack's like, I'll pass. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Just great stuff, man. Uh, all right. Back to questions for uh, Tom. Uh, and also, we could wrap up. We're soon. here for the Dragnet Pod, for the memories it's of Dragnet exactly. Podcast. Uh, Tom said Strange Adventures was inspired by the Mueller investigation, yes. and there will now be two sequel investigations from it. Uh, Durham uh, and, and investigation into the <laughs> will uh, will Strange Adventures get two sequels? No. <laughs> yeah. No, I think he said what he wanted to say about uh, poor disturbed Adam. Strange. I like that question though. That was that. I I, I like that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what would be the equivalent of the of the Durham investigation. I mean. I should say that Strange Adventures started off when we thought the Mueller education would would, uh, would save us. Like that was we there was kind of this like oh he's going to discover the yep the um but he never and it, the, well he did well he did what he could he's too much of a straight arrow where you can't indict a sitting president and then you had Bill Barr uh basically whitewash uh the Mueller report succinctly in sound bites 
And I really hate that Bill Barr is uh, on his. Uh, John, bit. we're here to talk about comics, not I about know. this crap. There's enough crap. Enough. Sorry, there man. are a thousand podcasts that people want to talk about that. Stuff. I know. You're bumming me out, man. We You're are here to talk about. <laughs> well, people asked her old def- defamatory web stories. Are, do you have time to read, Tom? Are you are you reading any uh, comics that you'd like to uh, draw people's attention to that are not your own? Uh, um, no. <laughs> uh, I, no, yes, no. I, I did some comic book reading recently. Uh, I, I read the last Ronin, um, which was really good. If you guys haven't checked that out, that was a, like a that was a really fun sure story. But where they reunite and, and tell it's like a cool, and I love the mystery of like which which turtle is it, and then and it brought it brought back you know, I, I I'm of the generation where turtles you know were just the, the, one of the central toys of our of our lives, and um, and 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 that that was. Just, just incredible. And I got, to, you know, I got to work with him on, um, on that our commandy issue, and he was very kind. And yeah, he, utter, utter legend that changed the world. Um, uh, so that was that was that was awesome. I, I, I uh, caught up to, to uh, the Punisher with the hand, um, Jason's Punisher. Yes. Uh, and that's brilliant, brilliant, very, very good Punisher. If you're in, if if you're into Punisher, if if you just want to read something that's about bloody killing, but it also has sort of a deeper message, so you get both the sides of like I want to see bad guys get their heads chopped off, plus I want to see an examination of what murder is. Like, like I, I, I can't recommend that Punisher story um, highly enough. Uh, it's, it's very good. Uh, I've started to dig into to Kyle Higgins universe that he's building, the um, the Radiant Black universe, and I, I think that's utterly fascinating. I think Kyle's been just one of the, the nice guys in comics. He's been absolutely. So- so very kind to me since I first came in. We kind of came in together at the same time, and to see him be like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what Kirkman did." But there's so many people try to do what Kirkman did, and he's like, "I'm gonna do that," and, and to, to take that by the horns and and to create something that's very much him, but is very much an entire world. I'm, I'm jealous, and I think it's very cool. Um, so yeah, th- those those are three that stuck out to me recently that I I I, I, I kind of really enjoy. That sounds great, man. Oh, I, I read Stray Dogs, uh, which is also brilliant. I should say, I want, but everybody knows that's brilliant. Got, like, we were against each other in the Eisners. We both lost. So, I also like what uh, mentioning Fleet, Fleece. mentioning uh, yeah, indeed Tony Fleece uh, and uh, mentioning Tony. Love what he and Celia are doing with Local Man. Yes, read Local Man. I've read the first issue. It's brilliant, um, and it's it's Tim doing the best thing. Tim understands the '90s comics better than anybody else, in that he was a super fan of those, and he made some of them, and worked with every single person that's been on them. And he understands those comics from inside out. He understands what's great about them, and he understands what's absurd about them. And it, it's it's the exact comic I would want Tim Seeley to make. And and I um, agree. And I, I I think it's it's brilliant, and it's nice to see him draw drawing because Tim Tim is a beautiful artist. Uh, Greg wants to know why uh, you chose to use the FBI in Killing Time as opposed to other comic booky mystery government organizations like Argus or the DEO or Spiral? Oh, that's a good question. Cause you know, um, for this, this penguin comic book I'm doing, um, yeah. Agent Espinosa is coming back. So she, 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 she returns. Uh, uh, why did I choose the FP? I mean, I think cause we we're just early on in Batman's career. I mean, this was a year two story. And so I, I think of like Batman being, you know, by the time Argus and all that stuff established, I feel like we're 10 years into Batman's career. So at the very beginning, I just don't think those organizations exist the same. So I was just I, I was just trying to ground it a little bit more. And, and, and kind of, I also wanted to make her, I don't know, maybe, maybe just because I worked a lot with the FBI when I was a kid. So maybe they're, they're in the back of my head as, as, as sort of that. Um, and of course, I'm from the CIA side, so we were always fighting with them. So, so I made well, them the bad guys. All right. We're at two hours. I mean, is there anything else you want to hit that we haven't uh, talked about? We could wrap up if you want. No, no, that's I mean if there's a few more questions I can handle it, but if if, if we're okay, we're okay. I'm good. Uh Brock really fast wants to ask, uh, what are some of the uh maybe rarer comics you're hunting for for your own collection? Uh generally speaking, I don't collect rare comics. Um yeah, uh yeah, I I, I collect art. I was gonna um, say if you want to say specific artists that you're looking for. No, I don't want to say specific artists because I've seen. I'll get really into an artist and I'll see people raise their prices because they realize I'm out there. So I'm not gonna tell you, you, you people. You know, 
You're like, oh, Tom King, he, he scored that Supergirl movie. Let's let's double all the prices on the art. The, the, all the dealers know what art I like, and they, they're already raising the prices on it. So fuck those guys. No, they're wonderful people. I love them. Um, <laughs> and you uh, want to but, see what but, art you picked uh, up lately? Uh, what art have I picked up lately? I just picked up a, um, a, a cover to a 50s pulp uh, paperback novel, a very noir sort of painted cover uh, by Harry, by Harry uh, Burton. Uh, Barton. Okay. Uh, um, I've said this before, but I, I love the art of um, On Stage by uh, Leonard Starr. It's my, yes. one of my favorite things of all time. I, oh, I yeah. Saw, so I just picked up A Gorgeous Sunday. Um, wow. Uh, from from him. From Leonard Starr. That's terrific, man. By yeah. the way, mentioning that pulp cover, I haven't been to uh, San Diego in years. I think 2018 was the last time I was there. And um, that one booth that has nothing but paintings of – Original pulp covers, and the- I, got, I, I got one at the booth this year. I bought I bought a pulp cover from them just this year. Yeah, they're called. If the I had grape- money to burn, I would just like ransack that that uh, space and just litter my walls with with the art because that stuff is so gorgeous. And again, that's why I love uh, the the cover to uh, Human Target Eleven. The I mean, and Greg's just been killing it, you know, left and right with all these covers, all the interiors. But right there, I mean, just again, uh, that's that's to me, that's Robert McGinnis. Uh, I bought my first Robert McGinnis this year, so I got I got one. Uh, it's Robert McGinnis doing Doris Day, so it's. it's you told a, me about this. What movie yeah. was it again? Like it's like After Dark or something. It's like it's not a movie you'd ever heard of. Uh, oh, was it that weird? Like, because I know she made that '60s almost Hitchcockian film. Uh, the you know, in the midst of her James Garner uh, romance movies and Rock Hudson romance movies and stuff. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I have the poster for it. I can't, I can't remember. It I think no I problem. talked about it before. Yeah, I got yeah, that, yeah. that that this year. Um, so cool. yeah, I, I I I love the um when I when I buy art, I buy stuff that's usually nineteen uh seventy two and below. Like I, I like art with letters on it. I like art that takes me back. I'm not sent as we talk about. I'm not sentimental for my childhood. Like Stranger Things doesn't do any. I like the the show because it's good, but the the sentimental part of it, I I don't have sentiment for the eighties and the nineties, but I have sentiment for my parents' childhood and for my grandparents' childhood. That's a deep psychological question which we could get into sometime. But the, but that that that's the kind of art I like. I like I like older art from the fifties. Um, uh, Greg asked. Uh, I guess Clayton Cowles recently was on Dave Harper's Off Panel podcast. He once had a letter and issue of Batman. In two hours, do you remember <laughs> what issue that was and the circumstances around it? No, uh, but it was probably for me because he did all of my Batman issues except the first four, which, which John Workman did. Uh, you usually, uh, you you I mean, typically, I don't want to throw anyone under the best, but that that's usually an artist thing. That's it's 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 my scripts are always. I mean, obviously, they're done before the artist, but yeah. But, but I've seen I've seen Clayton hit harder deadlines than that. I saw him hit a hard deadline this morning. Clayton is – you see – letterers are the ones – you know, we just – they're the ones who have to fill – letters and colorists are like, everyone gets to be late, and then you're like, letters and colorists, I'm so sorry, but you have to need this tomorrow. They're, 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 they're the ones who get the shit at the end of the day, and 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 the, the best ones know, know how to deal with that. I've seen Iliad- Clayton, Clayton's, one, Clayton's one of, if not the best. Iliopolis has told me about that from a Marvel standpoint. And yeah, man, no, that's that's the last line of defense before it goes to the printers. And they're the ones that really go through the biggest headaches in terms of fitting the blooms through the art and everything else. And no, it's a, it's a lot of work. And, and you really uh, you have to hand it to the letterers uh, and, and having that tough job of making it all work and, and, and be seamless and not notice and be. God, I just saw somebody on Twitter put up and it was crazy uh, word balloon placement in an old. Silver Age X Men comic where literally it's Magneto talking and the word balloon from head to belt completely blocks Magneto as he's talking, and it's like again that was the '60s. What are you gonna do? You know, uh, and back then they're doing that on the board, like like big, and, and different people did different things. You know, um, uh, Harvey Kurtzman fam- famously would write before the artist got any any pages, he would write all the balloons in. So you had to draw around them. Around them, yes. Um, and uh, I, can't, I can't imagine doing it. Because uh, Clayton and I are now well oiled machine. We've done like 200 books together. But I do a lot of, I do changes in letters. He told me I wasn't the worst of anyone he worked with. But I don't think I was easiest either. Uh, <laughs> but 
but but but we're we're pretty well oiled machine now. We have, we have, we have a good communication. Um, and he, no, no one's better at where, at where to put the balloons. I'm always amazed that, that he finds room to put balloons. Because so. I don't, you, you talk about this frequently. Uh, artists, you know, you, you, in comics, something you have to think about is like the person who talks first has to be on the left. Um, and I, I don't think about that in my scripts at all. I, that, never, that thought never enters into me. The poor artists always have to deal with that. And so Clayton's constantly dealing with, oh, Tom didn't think about this beforehand because he's an ass. So, Well, as we wrap up, congratulations on the James Gunn news. We're all very excited of the prospect of a Supergirl movie based on your story. Um, uh, we hope that you have great involvement in that. And just in general, again, I think of the Marvel movie panel back in the day, but I think this is more of an active role that uh, you, as James Gunn said in, in interviews, and I will say it because it's out there now in public, that you are one of the key writers uh, that he has assembled for uh, this great ambitious line of uh, film, TV, and animation that he's got coming up. That's great to hear. And I think, you know, he couldn't find a better person. So congratulations on that. We uh, we continue to follow Danger Street, uh, which is uh, just killing it. Uh, we're uh, about uh, two thirds of the way done with Gotham City year one. Uh, uh, let's see what else. Uh, of course, Human Target, one more issue. And uh, I look forward to some heartbreak and some uh, bittersweetness in, uh, in the wrap up to this amazing series. And everybody should know that uh, coming on uh, Valentine's Day, from Ilza Chartier and uh, and Tom, this isn't the cover for it, but uh, Love Everlasting, uh, the fantastic uh, time travel uh, take on uh, on bitter sweet romance, uh, as uh, as depicted by uh, Ilza and uh, and Tom. That again is coming on uh, you know on uh, on Valentine's Day, so that's excellent. Yes, and if you're frustrated that Supergirl is sold out, we're gonna have the same problem on Love Everlasting when we get our do our big announcements. So get 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 that ahead of time. And indeed, uh, also more uh, Dawn of DC announcements coming from Tom. We're also looking forward to Brave and Bold and the Penguin uh, miniseries coming up. See, see, I'm telling you, 15 projects. I'm tired. I'm tired, John. I get it, man. No, I, I'm, I'm impressed that my brain was able to uh, hold all that. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you got it all. Well done. Oh, and of course, there's the secret project coming out that you're that you're in that you know about that they don't know about. That that John Sunter is going to be the new hero of the DC universe. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that's good because they, uh, you know, I, my ultimate ultimate principal, Suntress, uh, you know, no one's touched him since Chris Sami put me in uh, one of the uh, Miles Morales issues. I, I did a boxing thing and you're the color man on the side. Outstanding. The fantastic. There you go, yeah. everybody. No, it's not you, legally speaking, but, you know, coincidentally, a guy named John Sunter. It's completely unrelated. I understand. That's good. Don't sue me, well, John. Don't sue me. I was going to say, I, 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 you, you, just, you just avoided the lawsuit. That's, <laughs> this close. That's this close. Oh, my God. Uh, so, uh, Zach wanted to know uh, upcoming guests oh. for a word balloon. Go yes. ahead. What were you going to say? No, you go. You're closing. Go, go, go. Okay. Uh, no, I got um, John David Jackson's going to come out tomorrow night. He, uh, along with uh, great comics, uh, also is uh, writing great Star Trek novels. He just wrote A Strange New Worlds. Uh, novel that comes out later this month. So awesome. we'll be talking to him. Uh, next week, I'm talking to Jason Iman, who, uh, Inman, who uh, has uh, the One new... The uh, nicest people in comics. Absolutely. Uh, uh, super Superhero best friend. I, I'm sure I'm murdering the title, but uh, we're going to talk about the new issue for that. Uh, oh, who else have we got next week? I don't have the calendar in front of me. Um, oh, Mark Russell is coming up uh, on the 10th. A week that from a week One of the most Doug original Tom. thinkers in oh, comics, right. and and a total incredibly nice guy. Mark and I always sit next to each other in the Eisners and console each other when we lose. We have a tradition. Brad Meltzer and uh, Eric uh, Palicki are both coming up next Monday, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Brad, talk got, to Brad today. What a mensch! Love that Brad. Oh man, uh, Nazi conspiracy. We'll talk about that book, and also yeah, yeah. I am John Lewis, his newest uh, children's biography. And uh, we'll be talking about both of those projects. And John Lewis was my neighbor back in my when I used to live a few blocks south of here, and he used to he really liked my youngest son, Kraz. And Aww. so, 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 there, so I, I have like pictures of him because you know, he, you know, when he was a little baby, so John Lewis would pick him up and play wow. with him. Wow! Yeah, so he would, so I have pictures of John Lewis playing with with my little guy Crosby. When so uh, when his when his graphic novels were coming out, and he was at San Diego, it was such an amazing thing to see this such an important man from American history at Comic-Con. I mean, I'm sorry. Kareem was at Comic-Con. A lot of big celebrities I've seen at Comic-Con. John Lewis was the last man to see, and everyone was so thrilled that he was there, and we were all so 
uh, we, we, we kept the respectful distance, but man, what a, what a guy. Yeah. He for was sure. amazing. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. So, so yeah, that's, uh, and then, uh, eventually I'm going to be talking to, uh, uh, my buddy, Bill Detloff, uh, one of the uh, ringside seat guys that works with Mike Cronenberg. He's got a brand new biography of one of the great, uh, eighties, uh, champions, Matthew Saad Muhammad, really tough Philadelphia fighter, tough life too. And, uh, that's, uh, I'm looking forward to reading that book and talking to, bill about that so that'll give you an idea of some of the stuff that's coming up in uh, february here on word balloon so until uh, next time i thank everybody for watching great questions as always and until next time everybody stay safe stay happy stay healthy mm -hmm.